Yo, it's your boy Ryan, Northwest Sports Fanatics, back at you with a new video. Today is Wednesday, October 11th, 2023, with your boy Ryan and the Northwest Sports Fanatics. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel, smash that like button either now or on your way out. Donate to your boy if you can, cash app, dollar sign, O-R-I-O-N-N-W-S-F, or the YouTube Super Chat right here. We got the NLDS game number three. Los Angeles Dodgers versus the Arizona Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks got a 2-0 lead in L.A., and they are here to be able to try to get the brooms and try to end the Dodgers' season tonight. Let's get into the thumb and go into the starting lineups. Oh, baby. And on the thumb, I got Mookie Betts. And one of my favorite players that's on the scene, Corbin Carroll. Let's go, baby. Let's get into the starting lineups. All right, baby. Going with the visiting Los Angeles Dodgers. Leading off. Second baseman, Mookie Betts. Batting second, first baseman, Freddie Freeman. Batting third, DHing for Los Angeles tonight, J.D. Martinez. Batting cleanup and batting fourth, third baseman, Mad Max Muncie. Batting fifth, catching for Los Angeles, Will Smith. Batting sixth, playing right field tonight, Jason Hayward. Batting seventh, playing center field, Kike Hernandez. Batting eighth, playing left field, David Peralta. And batting ninth, playing shortstop for LA, Miguel Rufa. And on the mound for the Dodgers, Lance Lynn. Let's go, baby. Let's go into the starting lineups for the home Arizona Diamondbacks. All right, baby, let's go. Leading off for the Diamondbacks, Phenom right fielder, Corbin Carroll. Batting second, playing second base for Arizona, Cattell Marte. Batting third, playing DH for Arizona, Tommy Pham. Playing cleanup and batting fourth, first baseman, Christian Walker. Batting fifth, playing catcher tonight for the Diamondbacks, Gabriel Moreno. Batting sixth, playing left field, Lars Gordial Jr. Batting seventh, playing center field for the Diamondbacks, Alec Thomas. Batting eighth, the OG third baseman, Evan Longoria. And batting ninth, playing shortstop for the Diamondbacks, Eduardo Perdomo. And on the mound for the Diamondbacks, Brandon. Ah. Let's go, baby. I am ready. Could be a good one tonight. Let's go, baby. Let's turn this up. And obviously, we haven't got a whole lot of production, you know, out of Mookie Betts as well as Freddie Freeman. But you could definitely tell who's hungry and who wants this. And I know my dad, uh, my dad's been a Dodger fan, you know, since the 50s. Uh, and normally, I'm rooting for the Dodgers if the Mariners aren't in it. But this year, I'm rooting for the Diamondbacks. No offense to, to the Pops and to my dad, but I feel like the Dodgers were kind of frauds going into this playoff. I felt the pitching was a little beat up. I felt that the batting and the hitting was kind of suspect. And then as you go in the lineup, you know, from batters five through nine, they haven't been very good this year. So I'm going to go not necessarily with the best team, you know, like with the Dodgers and the Braves. I'm going to go with the hottest teams going into the playoffs, and that would have been the Diamondbacks and the Phillies, and that's who I think is going to advance. And then on the flip side, 
we had other teams that you know were pretty good, like the Orioles and obviously the Blue Jays, but we already noticed that that particular division couldn't even get one win in the playoffs. They went 0 for 7. So we already know that the Astros and Rangers are going to be in the ALCS, and now that's the proper, correct two teams to get there. We thought it was going to be Dodgers-Braves, but we're probably going to end up getting Diamondbacks and Phillies. And then I would assume the Phillies would end up winning, and uh, Cinderella's story for the Diamondbacks will end, but you never know. But we have to be able to get the sweep and try to get it over with tonight. Uh, and obviously, I know that a lot of pressure is on you know, for the Dodgers to get at least one. But uh, I definitely would not be shocked if the Diamondbacks get the brooms and they end up advancing. And then we have uh, Phillies, obviously, going tomorrow against the Braves with a 2-1 lead with a big win today. Let's go. And like I said, you know, a lot of times, you know, with that break where you have like a week off where all the other wild card teams are playing so they can stay hot if they're hot at the regular season. And if you're really, really good, you know, winning 90, 95, 100 plus games, but then you're off for a week or a week and a half waiting to see who you're going to play, that is a huge uh, disadvantage for those first place teams and second place teams in the National League and the American League. But it looks like with the Astros and Rangers, it didn't phase them. You know, obviously, with, you know, the Astros and the Orioles had that top, top record, right? But with the Rangers, it didn't phase them on the Orioles, What? not even one bit. So uh, I'm very excited to see what we're going to end up getting here today. Daniel in the building, what's good? Sarah in the building, what's good? Let's get to 100 and donos. Let's do it. Five dollar holla. Let's go, baby. Appreciate you. Let me know what you want to see for photos once we get into the break, and I got you. Bang, 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 boom, boom, boom. Bang, bang, 95 to go. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Five doll hairs. Let's get to a hundo. Tommy has been very, very clutch. You know, you got Longoria and Fam that are kind of been journeymen. Uh, and then Cattell Marte, Corbin Carroll are money. So you never really know what is going to happen. Yeah, we're only eight subs away. So we're starting to grind. And then we'll get to 20,100. So reflect in the building what's good. And uh, I feel with... Uh, you know, this particular team with the Dodgers, I don't really have a connection to them this season besides my dad. And uh, with Paul Seawald and that trade with the Diamondbacks and, you know, us obviously getting a couple pieces in return, you know, I felt that it worked out pretty well for us, even though uh, I, you know, I still miss Seawald. So, um, you know, I'll be rooting for the Diamondbacks today, probably the very first time that I'm rooting against my dad's Dodgers. But I felt going into the playoffs that they were kind of frauds. And if you're not really legit going into the playoffs, you will get exposed. The Dodgers got exposed at home. They are not winning this series at all. Big facts. Let's go, baby. And I like Corbin Carroll. I like Marte. Uh, Walker is underrated. Uh, Gurriel Jr. is nice. Uh, and obviously Longoria and Fam as being those kind of journeymen coming in, giving them a little extra juice. And then on top of that, you know, you got Paul Seawald on the Diamondbacks. So, um, and I, I like rooting for at least one underdog story. We didn't get it with the Orioles, even though they had a really, really good record. So really the only team that we can say as far as underdogs are the Phillies, you know, but we knew they were very dangerous making it to the World Series last year. And it doesn't matter if you end up having the best record. It doesn't mean that you're going to come out on top. The number one seed in Major League Baseball has lost two years in a row, and it looks like they're going to lose three years in a row, and this might be the second year in a row by Philadelphia. Big facts. Let's go, baby. Oh, yeah, I'm not doing it. I'm going to be doing the, I'm going to be doing the Bucks and the Lions. So I'll be watching the morning games, and we'll do the Bucks and the Lions. And then once the Bucks and the Lions are, are done, uh, then I'll just do reaction videos the, the rest of the night. Um, since that matchup is just going to be kind of, you know, nothing special. And then we'll get back to it on uh, Monday Night Football. But that way I can pump out a few more reaction videos. Um, unless for, you know, whatever reason, you know, something changes. But, I mean, it's it's Bills and Giants, right? So we already know, like, everyone on the Giants is injured. The Bills, even though they have injuries on defense that are weak right now, um, you know, are a little bit suspect and in trouble. But when you're playing arguably one of the worst teams in football, you know they're going to probably end up winning by 20. Little dribbler to Longoria, one away. There we go. I, I, I think you were an underdog going into the playoffs this year. You know, and, and if you act like, you know, you, you guys were the favored team, you know, going into the playoffs, you weren't. 
you know, everyone knew that the Braves had the number one record and even the Dodgers had a better record, you know, going in. You guys were the third best team in the National League. But again, it's good to be an underdog. It's all right to be an underdog. And like I said, sometimes it's not about being the best team. It's about being hot and healthy. And if you're hot and healthy, that sometimes will let you advance against a team that's supposedly based off record that's better than you. So, yeah, and it doesn't matter what you did last year. What you did last year was last year. Last year is last year. This year is this year. But again, you guys are getting hot, you know, and uh, moving forward, I think the Phillies will start to get a little bit more respect, but it'll always be Braves, Dodgers, Phillies. We just have to decide what order that, you know, the pecking order is going to be. Uh, and honestly, with Philadelphia not being the number one seed, I think they play better baseball that way. Once they end up becoming like that number one team in the National League and then all the targets are going to be on their back, then uh, I'm not saying that they're going to fail, but I think this situation works out the best for them. Popped up, Corbin Carroll with that nice out. Let's go, baby. Let's go to the bottom of the first. Yeah, well, again, regular season is regular season, but the big thing for me, it's hot and healthy, but also it's that break in between after you end up you know, making the playoffs. And if you're off for about seven to 10 days, almost every team that was off struggled tremendously, right? And like, if you're looking down the pecking order, I mean, really the only teams that uh, didn't really struggle is maybe Houston, you know, but obviously with the Orioles, they didn't play good. You know, Twins, eh, Blue Jays, eh, you know what I'm saying? And then the Rangers as that road team, they were hot. You could argue them and the Astros were the two hottest teams going into the playoffs in the American League. And then the Phillies, obviously, uh, and the Diamondbacks might have been the hottest going into the National League. And both are on the cusp of advancing, which it would be pretty cool if you ask me. Well, you, you would think so. You would think so that they could get to that 100-win uh, pinnacle. But we'll have to end up seeing if they end up winning the World Series this year, which uh, if you can end up beating the Braves, you can definitely beat the Diamondbacks. And then, you know, you have to end up seeing if you can beat the Rangers or the Astros. And legitimately, if we end up getting Phillies, Astros, or Phillies, Rangers, it is 50-50. Like, I could definitely see the Rangers winning it all. I could definitely see the Astros winning it all. But I do like what Philadelphia brings to the table, and I could see them doing it. But it's not going to be easy. You know, like I said, it's going to be one of those things. It'll be a tougher matchup than the Atlanta Braves so far. I think once you get to the World Series with all the eyes on you, it won't be a sweep. You know, it's not like Philadelphia is going to go in and, uh, you know, win four games in a row against the Astros or the Rangers. You know, those teams are good enough to win at least a couple, but maybe even more than two, possibly three. And, you know, it wouldn't shock me if the Rangers or Astros win four, but uh, maybe we'll end up getting a seven-game series if we end up getting that particular scenario. So, yeah, twins are garbage. And I, I, one thing I do really appreciate uh, about Corbin Carroll, not just being from the Pacific Northwest, is that he's patient. And I was just joking with my buddy Jay Graves, who's you know a Mariner fan as well, and we were complaining about DePoto and hoping that Scott can get someone that's better than DePoto at his side, You know, not wanting to spend money and whatnot, be patient and all this shit, right? Corbin Carroll is the epitome of patience. And I wish Julio would learn a thing from a guy like this because these guys are always going to be kind of connected with each other. You know, Julio is that up-and-coming name. Corbin Carroll is that up-and-coming name as well. And uh, I trust Corbin Carroll even more than Julio in the box. I really do. And I know a lot of Mariner fans probably do as well. And uh, I have no problem rooting for Corbin Carroll, you know, even though my dad's been a Dodger fan since the 50s. But they look like the better team. They don't, they're not happy to be there. You know, at one point, you got to remember, they were in first place over the Dodgers in the division. It didn't last long, but they had a couple moments where they were in first place, you know, in the – you know, in the National League, they're in the National League West. So I feel that you know, they're not intimidated, you know, in getting that cornerstone piece in Corbin Carroll is what they needed. And then adding pieces like Evan Longoria and Tommy Pham were clutch. Patel Marte is very underrated like Christian Walker. So I, I feel that they can do it. And really the bugaboo for the Dodgers has been injuries, shitty pitching. And if you have a shitty five through nine hole, kind of reminds me of like I'm talking about the Mariners. Sometimes the pitching is shitty. Sometimes a five to the nine hole is shitty. And uh, if you don't have that consistency, 
from the five to the nine hole with your starting pitching mid relievers or closers, even if you win 90 to 100 games, if you get a team that's hot and they're healthy and they're playing better baseball than you and they can get out to an early lead, it's going to be over. Like I could definitely see the Dodgers winning this game, but I think that there's a high probability that we get a Diamondback sweep tonight. That's how good I think that they are. Now, are the Diamondbacks good enough to beat the Phillies? I doubt that, you know, based on Philadelphia and, you know, who they have and based off their structure. But, I mean, if the Diamondbacks can win this, you never know. you got to have to wait for it to play out. But I would assume that if we get the Diamondbacks and the Phillies, I would probably say Phillies will win in six. That's what I would, what I would predict. I think that the Diamondbacks are good enough to win one or two, but not good enough to win against the Phillies. So I – I would assume that the Phillies will end up being in the World Series after they beat the Braves. And then uh, Astros, Rangers, take your pick. I really don't know. Uh, I feel that the Rangers are hotter, but the Astros have the experience. So I don't really know who's going to come out on top on there. So. Yeah, they did. Yeah, he did. And plus, you had the experience from last year, you know, and showing people that, hey, it's okay if we're the third best team in the National League to a lot of people going in. But I think a lot of people thought the Phillies were already better than the Dodgers. Dodgers had the record. But again, it's my dad's team. You know, he's been a fan for a long time. But I watched a, a lot of Dodger games. Like, you know, I covered over 100 Mariner games. But, I mean, I usually watch two games or three games at once. And I, I watched, you know, I would say – probably two thirds of the games this season, if not more. And the same problems continue to kind of repeat itself, you know, for that particular team. And I didn't really feel that they were as good as they were a few years ago when they were the best team in baseball, they've dropped off. And now not only have you dropped off and you can still win 90 to hundred games and still not be a very good team going into the playoffs. And that's what we got with Los Angeles, but the Phillies and the Atlanta Braves to me were much, much better going into the playoffs than Los Angeles. Los Angeles ended up having the, the record, but I felt it was a fraudulent record. And again, if you don't have any hits uh, between Mookie and Freddie Freeman in the first couple games, what do you think is going to happen? You're not going to win. You have to have those guys, the Hall of Famers, you know, hold up and, and hold it down, you know, for Los Angeles, you know, in those first two games, they needed to go like three for four, four for five, and two for four for each minimum. And if you're like, oh, for eight, you know, in, in like two games, with both guys, I mean, what do you expect that's going to happen? You're not going to win. So we'll see what happens tonight. But uh, I would not be shocked if we get the brooms out for the Diamondbacks. Yes, 95 to go. Let me know what you want to see for photos, even though you probably already messaged that earlier. Let me know. But it's nice. Uh, too bad the Kraken couldn't have got that dub yesterday. But, um, you know, hopefully Grubauer will be a little bit better throughout the season. And uh, I'm excited. So, you know, we got we got a couple new subs, you know, as well. And uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So we got baseball tonight. And we got Thursday night football tomorrow. And we'll have Colorado and Stanford on Friday. And then uh, Ducks Huskies. And they just released the Duck uniforms against the Huskies. And they are icy. Um, I can't wait to see that matchup. Even if we lose, um, it, it's going to be a battle. And like I said, I think the real key factor in the Ducks and Huskies is going to be the Ducks O-line that is very, very good this season and the Ducks defense. So if our O-line and our defense play up to par, I think we do have a chance. But if the O-line gets pushed around and the defense plays bad, it could get ugly. And I could see Michael Penix Jr. going off. So uh, we'll see what happens, but I hope it ends up being a very competitive matchup. And it's probably the... Uh, most excitement I've had for a matchup as far as Ducks Huskies, maybe ever. Um, so I'm definitely excited about that this weekend. And then we'll end up doing the Bucks and the Lions. This is actually probably one of the best weeks as far as like sports are in, involved. You know, you got Kraken starting off, we got baseball playoffs, a little college football, and actually a couple decent matchups this weekend for the NFL. So because the Bucks and uh, the Lions are right there with the Seahawks, uh, considered as you know maybe the third, fourth, fifth best team in whatever order you want to put them in, right below you know the uh, Niners and the Eagles. So a lot to prove this weekend with the top five teams in the NFC. And then in the AFC, I mean it'll be a crapshoot. For now, it's the Chiefs and the top spot, and then maybe Dolphins, Bills, 
Uh, but maybe the Bills will leapfrog the Dolphins, even though they have some injuries on defense. And maybe the Bills end up being the number one seed, even with the injuries. I don't think there really is a team in the AFC that I'm like, oh my God, they are so good. Uh, they, they're going to beat somebody in the NFC. Like I feel the AFC is weak this year. You know, not only with chemistry, injuries, and, and just overall, I don't really feel like anyone in the AFC can win the Super Bowl this year. Normally it's like Chiefs all the way, but I don't think they're as good as they were in the past few years. Juju's not there. Eric Bieniemy's not there. Yes, are they still winning games, but they're winning games ugly. And I think that this might be the year finally that the NFC gets back to winning you know, the championship and bringing the Lombardi home to the NFC, either with the Niners or the Eagles. I would be very shocked if it's not one of those two teams that brings the Lombardi home this year. And again, if you end up having Josh Allen, if you end up having Patrick Mahomes or like a Tua, you're probably going to have a chance because the offense is so explosive. But if the balance of the teams, you know, even you could say with like the Lions, you know, they got more balance than any team in the AFC right now too with O-line, D-line, offense and defense. So eventually that team that has the most balance, which the Eagles should have won the Super Bowl last year. But again, if you don't have any, uh, you know, D-line presence, no sack lunches, no picks, then you're going to lose a Super Bowl every single time. Throw to first, got him. Muncie is out. Next up for Los Angeles, Will Smith. I do like Bob Costas. Um, you know, I know a lot of people don't like him and whatnot, but after you listen to so many like shitty baseball announcers and shitty NFL and NBA announcers and just sports in general, like uh, he has kind of a stoic voice. It's kind of majestic. Can I listen to Bob Costas like every day? I don't know if I would go that far, but I do think that he has a good playoff baseball voice. And just like Joe Buck, he's better at baseball than he is at football with Troy Aikman. Popped up. There we go. Corbin Carroll. Two away. Next up for the Dodgers, right fielder, Jason Haywood. And I tried to find some good uh, spinning logos. I found one for the Dodgers, but it didn't really look that good. And then they didn't have anything really stylish for the Diamondbacks, so we're just using transparent logos. But I'll look again to see if I can find something. But, I, you know, it's got to look good. You know, it's got to it's be stylish. It can't just be like some choppy version of a spinning logo. 269 average, 15 homers for Jason Hayward. Oh, my boy, Judah in the building. How are you, man? Reflect, did you hear about the bad news with Root Sports today? Did you? I'm not sure if you heard about it, but my phone was blowing up this morning with notifications. Did you hear about the news and what they're deciding to do? As far as uh, the Mariners and as far as the Blazers, right? So they're deciding to go through uh, Root Sports Plus. So now they're taking Root Sports, you know, the alternative channel that used to be free. Now you have to pay $20 more just to be able to watch Blazer games locally. And you wonder why, you know, a lot of Blazer fans kind of gave up on the team. It's not on KGW. It's not on local TV, on ABC or CBS or KGW like it was back in the day. And then now you can't even watch any local games. I mean, you can only watch NBA TV or ESPN if you have those channels. So um, obviously they're making it much more difficult, you know, to be able to grasp and watch uh, you know, obviously the Blazers coming up, and we'll see if they end up doing that with the uh, Mariners as well. Now, we still have streaming sites, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, have like a little bit of a delay, 30 seconds. But I feel bad for a lot of the Blazer fans because all they want to do is just support their team. And then we don't have Dame anymore. And uh, so many people are hella pissed. And so I don't know if they're going to go to some of the alternative options. Um, you know, that will be available. And like, I don't know if it's like Tubi or, or something else, but there's going to be a couple other options like, you know, Dish or DirecTV and then like one other service, but they don't have like a, a streaming service. So they're getting greedy, you know, about the money. They should just make it something where they have Root Sports Mobile or Root Sports, the streaming service, so everyone can watch. But obviously uh, they only care about money and that is kind of shitty for 
Blazer fans. And I know you're probably not a Blazer fan per se, but if they're doing that for the Blazers, it makes me kind of wonder if they're going to do that for the Mariners moving forward as well. So tough, 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 tough. Yeah, and like I said, you know, one-on-one -on -one matchups, uh, you hold that really strongly. You know, like you beat this team. But when I look at a team, you know, I don't necessarily look at the one-on-one -on -one matchup. I look at the full product from the very first game to where we're at now. How did each team play every single game? Um, you know, even though if maybe the Seahawks did beat the Lions, I 100% agree that was a good win in overtime. But can we look at the Seahawks from the very first game to where they're at now? And can we honestly say that they played better in every game over the Lions? You know, regardless of Chris Jones and Travis Kelsey were out, because in years past, they still wouldn't have won that game. So, you know, and I think that the Seahawks are getting better and getting better. And maybe next year, you know, they'll get their Detroit Lions flowers like Detroit is getting this year. But as far as this year is concerned, I think the Seahawks and Buccaneers are close, you know, to Detroit. But we'll see what happens if, if Tampa Bay this weekend with the creamsicles at home, if we end up beating Detroit. But even if we beat Detroit, and even if we blow them out, and this is me being honest, I still don't think we're a better team overall than Detroit. Um, you know, even if we beat them on the one-on-one -on -one matchup, some games we've looked good, you know, and the defense has actually played pretty damn well. The only loss we have is to Philadelphia. And hell, they might be the Super Bowl champs, right? But, you know, I feel that, you know, with certain teams, it's a, it's a body of product you know, throughout every single game, not just one-on-one. -on -one, so, but I know you like to hang on to those one-on-one -on -one matchups and I get where you're coming from. A lot of people do, you know. What's good, brother? How are you? Oh man, they're nickel and diming. And I, there's so many Blazer fans that are just like, almost gonna like boycott. Like there's guys that even have season tickets saying, how am I spending thousands of dollars to, to go to the Blazers at Moda? And then if they're like on the road, I can't watch a game. Like, you know, but obviously these people will dig and find streaming, you know, options, you know, with different sites and whatnot that might have like a 30 second delay. But it, it does kind of suck that they're nickel and diamond like that. And it just makes me kind of wonder, you know, with Root Sports, because it sounds like even a lot of the Mariner fans don't like Root Sports in Oregon or Washington. You know, it's like, well, they have to deal with it and it's fine. But the Blazer fans, you know, don't like it at all because obviously it's, you know, located up in Washington and, you know, it's like they sold their rights, you know, to, you know, the teams up, up North and whatnot. It would be nice that if we could actually just have, you know, the blazer, like they did blazer cable, you know, and then they had them on KGW. Then they did blazer cable. Then they did root sports. And so it's like always nickel and diamond us, which is kind of shitty, but I'll still watch. I'm not going to give up on the blazers, but it does suck. Popped up. Hayward one away. Yeah, but that's but that's you as a Seahawk fan. You know what I mean? If we did a poll of, you know, just NFL fans in general, and it's not like they have any reason to hate on the Seahawks. They're not the Cowboys or the Patriots where there's some kind of stigma where we have to hate the Seahawks. You know what I mean? So Seattle fans, that's fine. You know, you guys are going to ride and die. And, you know, you might have been able to beat on the Lions the last couple of years. But what you did, you know, obviously last year, the one-on-one -on -one matchup this year, I get it. But if you look at the full product every single game, do you think you honestly have played better than Detroit every single game besides the one-on-one -on -one matchup? I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone will agree. You know, this just me being honest, you know, but again, if, if you want to ride or die with your team and, and you want to hang on to those, you know, one on one matchups and that's really what matters to you, you know, that that's your opinion. I got mine, you know, but I just feel that NFL fans that aren't Seahawks. And if you're just looking at it from a non biased opinion, I don't know how many people would agree that the Seattle Seahawks are better than the Detroit Lions right now. You know, as far as every single game from game one to where we're at right now, getting into, you know, week five, week six, week seven. So, and it's not like they're that far behind, you know, it's like maybe one spot, you know, but I just don't think America thinks Seattle is better than Detroit. And the main reason that I also do say that is Detroit has a better O-line and D-line. And that's what I judge it on as well. They have a better O-line and D-line than the Seahawks. I think we can agree on that. And if you don't got a good O-line and D-line, 
I don't know if I can really uh, judge that Seattle is the better team. Now, you got a better secondary, I'll give you that, but your O-line and D-line is nowhere near what Detroit says. And it was impressive to end up getting the win on the road, but I, I haven't been as impressed with some of the other wins that you guys have had. You know, I think you guys have looked good, you know, just like the Buccaneers, we've looked good, but I don't think we look as good as Detroit. You know, I think that, to me, that's the third best team in the NFC. You don't you you think you think Seahawks have a better D line than Detroit? You guys don't got a Aiden Hutchinson though. Aiden Hutchinson's like one of the you know top five defenders this year with like a Max Crosby, you know, like a TJ Watt type of player. You guys have some guys there, but you not you don't got no Aiden Hutchinson there. Like imagine if you had Aiden Hutchinson on Seattle, it'd be different. Guriel in the box. Ah, uh, see, that's a biased comment, though. Better running backs? That's a little biased. Wide receivers? You might be able to get with the DK and, and the locket, but Amon Ross St. Brown and Josh Reynolds are, are, are very good. You know, and quarterback? I don't know, man. Uh, you know, Geno is good, right? But I think most people would say Jared Goff is better. Laporta? And the O-line rag now, Penny Sewell? So, I mean, Kenneth Walker is nice, but David Montgomery is just as good this season. You know, he might not be a popular name, you know, obviously with Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker the third, but I think a lot of people would say Montgomery is, you know, just on that same level with Brees or with Kenneth Walker. Maybe some people would say even better. So, but again, I mean, you know, third best team in the NFC, fourth best team, fifth best team. It's pretty much Seattle, Tampa, and Detroit. But again, like, you know, it's even me being a Tampa fan, even if we blow them out by 20, Det Detroit is better. Like, they have a better chance to go further in the playoffs this year, in my opinion, than, uh, than Tampa does, my own very team, or Seattle. Yeah, until we end up getting more depth, you know, on all sides of the ball, you know, I, I don't know. That's just my, my personal feeling. Yeah, but the thing is, or that you're a Seattle fan. You have to ask other fans what they think. So you, you can say, ah, it's not biased, it's not biased. But sometimes, you know, when you have so much love and passion for your players and your teams, you think, ah, I'm not being biased, I'm not being biased. But I guarantee if you took a poll and you asked 100 fans that aren't Seahawks fans or Lions fans and we go over the team, I don't know what you would get for results. And I would assume it would probably be 80% Detroit, 20% Seattle, maybe even higher. And it's not like I think they're bad, I'm just being real. You know, we, we can have our own perceptions here in the Pacific Northwest, but, you know, like I said, if we end up being Detroit by 20, what are we, we going to say? Are we going to say Tampa is better than Detroit and better than Seattle? Are we going to say that too? I guess we'll end up finding out once we uh, end up going a little bit further in the season who actually is better, and we'll see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I'm not going to be right about everything. OK, I'm not going to be right about everything, but I feel that I got a pretty good pulse, you know, watching the league as a whole. Bottom of the second runners at first and second Lynn, 22 pitches in. Evan Longoria, the OG. Let's go, baby. See if he can come up with a clutch hit here. 1 0 pitch, takes a strike, 1 1 count. Well, it's like it's all tit for tat. You know what I mean? Like, I have to be honest. It's not, you know what I mean? I, I've always been honest and give you how I feel no matter what, right? I've never been biased about this or that. I call it how I see it. You know, sometimes I'll agree with your guys' favorite teams and favorite players. Sometimes I won't. 
you know, I can't just make everybody happy and agree with every single person, uh, you know, that I meet or every single person on the, on the channel, you know, cause then I would be fake. I would be fugazi. I would be like everyone else on YouTube. You know, I can't be just a people pleaser. You know, I have to be honest and keep it real. Bottom of the second, runners at first and second, 3-1 count. See what Lynn can deliver to Longoria. Big swing and a miss. Count is full. Uh, because they didn't have uh they didn't have defense, you know, back when I was a kid, I was more of a Joe Montana, Jerry Rice guy for like the offensive purposes and with like, you know, some of my friends, you know, that were very diehard back then, but I didn't want to hop on the bandwagon. And then Dion was there in 94, struck him out, got him. Um, you know, and when Dion was there in 94, you know, I was thinking like I was 12 years old at that point, but I didn't want to be that guy that was fake and like a bandwagon hopping on the Niners five championships. You know, so I figured at that point, you know, I would wait one more year. And then obviously Tampa drafted Warren Sapp and Derek Brooks. John Lynch was there. And a lot of times, you know, the teams are going to be based off my personality and what I like. And obviously John Lynch, Rondé Barber, Mike Allstott, you know, Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks. That's more my personality. And then, uh, you know, ended up sticking with them, you know, pretty much, you know, by the time I was 13 and I'm, I'm 41 you know, now, and, you know, I haven't wavered. So, you know, it's pretty much the only team that I root for that's outside of the Pacific Northwest. So Mariners, Kraken, Blazers, Ducks, everything in the Pacific Northwest. And then uh, not Seattle, not the Niners, not the Raiders, not the Chargers, uh, but it's Tampa. So, yeah, you know, but I mean, if you grew up in the 80s, you know, uh, out here and you lived in Oregon, Washington, California, you know, uh, I mean, they were the team of the, the 80s and a little bit of the 90s as well. I would say 90s is probably a little bit more Cowboys. 80s was Niners. But, you know, growing up, you know, it was a lot of Joe Montana, a lot of Jerry Rice. But, but again, I'm more of a defensive fan in, in general. I'm not really like quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. I'm more like linebacker, safety, you know, DN, D tackle, corner, and then like offensive line. Now, it's not like I hate quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, but I think that those positions get enough pub on their own. And uh, it's like if I end up buying jerseys, I buy like linebacker jerseys and like safety and stuff like that, D tackle, D end, corner. Like, I'd rather represent the, the positions that are, you know, you know maybe underappreciated and whatnot. So, well, they don't have a defense. Travis Hunter, their best player is hurt. You know, besides, you know, uh, you know, Shadur Sanders as being the top guy and Hunter probably being the second best player, um, you know, so their defense is not good. So they're going to win some games, but they obviously, you know, got kind of a reality check, you know, especially playing Oregon, that, you know, Oregon, Washington, uh, you know, USC, we are the three best teams in the Pac-12. So Dion has already done plenty. I mean, they already only won a couple games, you know, and then Dion came around. So they've already matched and went above and beyond what Colorado has done in many, many years. So no one thinks that Colorado is going to be a national champion anytime soon, but they're going to be relevant. And that is good for, you know, college football moving forward. So. The creamsicles, they're pretty good. I'm not sure even me as a Tampa fan, I don't think they're the best because uh, orange creamsicles aren't for everyone. You know, I would say the Seahawk throwbacks are better. The Kelly Green Eagles are better. Um, you can argue the Patriots, you know, with the, the guy you know, going in the three-point stance. You know, I think those might be better. Houston Oilers with the oil slick might be better. But I would say after some of those, I would probably put Tampa in the top five, but not number one. I'm a defensive-minded person, you know what I mean? I, you know, a lot of people are always on the offensive, but it's always, you know, I like defense. You know, Lawrence Taylor, you know, looking at Ronnie Lott, you know, Ed Reed, Paul Amalu, you know, it just, it just depends on your personality. I would say a majority of fans that watch football are offensive minded and they buy the offensive jerseys. You know, I would say probably 90 to 95 percent. And then the other 5 percent is going to be buying like O-line jerseys, defensive jerseys, special teams. And that's the category I fall into. I kind of like the underappreciated athletes. 
Little chopper. Get the double play. One, two, got him. Well, you know, this is the first year. You can't expect someone to come into a dog shit team in a dog shit situation to go in there and then all of a sudden turn it around in one year and be a national champion. It's not going to happen. But as long as Dion stays there for like, let's say five years, unless he gets a better opportunity, because I would assume this is just going to be a stepping stone for him to get a job that's bigger, like an Ohio State or a Michigan type of job down the road. But if he ends up staying at Colorado for five years, you know, uh, a big run and possibly being like a nine and two or a 10 and one team in like four or five years, maybe, you know, but, you know, for now, you know, I think his goal will be, you know, try to be like an eight and four team or better and then continuously trying to get better every year, you know, eight and four, then nine and three, then 10 and two, and then eventually 11 and one, but you have to have players. And, you know, if you don't have the recruiting, you're not going to be able to compete with the big boys. You know, you got to be able to get those five-star athletes, and the more five-star blue chip athletes he gets, and the more people want to play for Dion, the better that they're going to do. Fouled off to from Rojas. Yeah, but he's already changed the game because you're already getting like females. Um, you're you're getting you know athletes that play other sports. Um, you're also getting you know people like guys that have no care for college football whatsoever. But now they're paying attention because Dion is there based off how he was at Florida State, how he was on Atlanta, you know how he was on for the, the Cowboys and the Niners, and you know even you know I guess if you want to throw in the Ravens and the Redskins when he was there but I don't think anyone really cares when he was there that was like at the end of his career and then what he did for the Atlanta Braves but you know Dion and just his personality alone and bringing that swagger in so but he's good for college football I got no problem with Dion I, you know he's still one of my top 5 favorite uh you know as far as players that were never on my own team you know but it will always be Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Barry Sanders, Bo Jackson and Dion those will always be my top five. So, and plus the Pac-12 is fucking loaded. So after you know he they move on and they go to like what the Big Twelve. You know, obviously Oklahoma and Texas are leaving, so it's going to open the door for Colorado to actually be a team that could win the Big Twelve down the road, especially with the recruiting trail that he's getting. Little chopper. Got him at first. Still knotted up at zero as we go to the bottom of the third inning. Now, if Texas and Oklahoma were going to stay, you know, the Colorado, all they would be able to do is probably get as high as third, uh, you know, down the road. But again, those two teams are moving to the SEC. So we're having pretty much just two major super conferences, the SEC and then the Big Ten. Uh, Pac-12 is no more after this year. And then uh, the ACC will be kind of garbage, the MAC. The Big 12, I mean, like all of those will be like kind of secondary divisions, uh, even lower than what the Pac-12 is right now. Uh, and then, you know, we'll see what it is. I mean, at some point, will the Big 12 have something special or the ACC or the MAC? Maybe, you know, but with so many good teams out of the Big 10 and the SEC, it's pretty safe to say that the champion in college football is going to come out of those two conferences, which it already has, but now scooping up USC, Oregon, UCLA, and Washington on top of Michigan and Ohio State, and then also getting Oklahoma and Texas adding to Georgia and Bama. Like, who the hell is going to end up beating those two conferences? Unless you have a special, like, Clemson team with Abo Sweeney, if you get like a Trevor Lawrence type of guy or a Deshaun Watson, and you get that type of team, then that will be a team that might be able to keep up or a Florida State team with Jameis. But it's going to take something really, really special moving forward for that ACC, you know, or Big 12 team to be like a top dog. You know, I think Colorado with Dion could maybe like in four, five, six years. But, you know, I don't see in the near future any team from the ACC or the Big 12 or the MAC or any other, you know, conference other than the Big 10 or the SEC uh, really holding it down. So Harper was the man tonight. But one thing that will be really exciting uh, is going to be seeing if USC, Washington, or Oregon 
in the next five years once we join, if we can knock off Ohio State and Michigan and be like ahead of them. Like think about like what people would think. People always want to talk shit, you know, about the Pac-10 and the Pac-12. Oh, these guys suck. They're not good. You know, this and that. But what happens in the next five years once we join that if Michigan and Ohio State are no longer a lock to win the conference? And I think that you're definitely going to get a lot of results from Washington, Oregon, and USC. And I wouldn't even count UCLA out after, you know, five or six years. If they keep building, you know, you would assume they're going to be there with like Iowa and Wisconsin. But with Chip, if he's still there and he's still on the recruiting trail, I could see him. UCLA, uh, you know, being in the top end of the division, like in the top six or seven, not in the bottom of the division. Like at some point, UCLA could be that team right there with Wisconsin and Iowa and hell, maybe even better than those teams. It's possible. But, uh, you know, but they're not there yet. You know, they definitely have some, uh, you know, room to grow. And I definitely would put, you know, probably like that Wisconsin, Iowa, you know, type of team ahead of them for now. But I think pretty soon, UCLA will be on the same level as Iowa and Wisconsin and maybe even surpass those teams. And then it'll end up being a five-team race between Oregon, Washington, USC, uh, Michigan, and Ohio State. So it's going to be exciting. Well, you got to think, UCLA is not going to be as good as, as like, you know, the other teams in the Pac-12 or Michigan or Ohio State right away. But they could definitely compete with the second-tier teams, and, and then we'll see what happens there, you know. I don't think it would be crazy to think like, oh, Chip Kelly's there for five years and UCLA one year goes like eight and four. Would we would we really be that shocked, you know, if that happens or if they go like seven and five? Uh-oh. Back, back, back. Gone, baby. Let's go, Diamondbacks. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And you already know that they're going to win this game because when you're nine-hole hitter, Geraldo Perdomo, the shortstop goes yard. It's like when the Mariners do it, you know they're getting the dub. Get the brooms out. One, zero, Diamondbacks. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about, baby. And this might be the first year ever that I've rooted against my dad's Dodgers, but, you know, sometimes you just get the feeling a team is a fraud, and if the pitching isn't there, the superstars aren't hitting, right, and then the bottom half of the lineup isn't good, this is what happens. You get exposed, and it's about being hot and healthy, not being the best. The best record. Best record doesn't mean shit. Just ask the Atlanta Braves. Just ask the Dodgers. Because both teams are about to get eliminated. But even if UCLA keeps building, they're not going to ever be as good as Oregon or Washington or USC. And they're definitely not going to catch up to Michigan or Ohio State. The best that they can hope for is being the sixth best team and beating out Iowa and Wisconsin. That would be the goal. You know, to be up there with the other Pac-12 teams, you know, and with Michigan and Ohio State. So, and recruiting might be interesting for Chip, too, because you got to think with basketball, UCLA is pretty good. So they might be able to flip some athletes that play basketball and football. And instead of those guys being like, oh, I'm going to go to a different school, maybe they can get some of these football guys that will be like, well, the basketball team is pretty fire for UCLA every year. They usually end up making the, you know, Sweet 16, Elite Eight. Every once in a while, they'll make like a Final Four appearance, you know, here and there. Not Nothing as of recently, but, you know, it, they can get to the 32 spot. And then they sometimes will get to the Sweet 16. So maybe they'll feed off that type of moment and try to be like, hey, we're a basketball school. But maybe we can steal some recruits uh, for Chip as, as we're in the Big Ten now. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! Let's go. This one is over. Just like I told Preston. Preston wanted to doubt me like I was some kind of fucking idiot that didn't watch baseball this year. He knew Dodgers as the Dodgers as a big name. I was like, they're not playing good baseball right now, bro. He's like, and then they ended up winning, what, like 9-0? And here you go. Sometimes, you know, when you bet on games, that's one thing. But when you watch games in entirety, it's totally different. Because if you're just watching highlights on Twitter compared to someone that's watching the full amount of a game, you get to see a little more of the footage. You know, just seeing highlights doesn't do it justice. Nice job, Diamondbacks. Let's go, baby. And Cattell Marte has been hot, 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 baby. He's been a very underrated piece. Nice job, baby. You don't want none of that, baby. You don't want none of that. Corbin Carroll, stud. Marte, stud. Fam, sleeper. 
just like Evan Longoria, sleeper. And then uh, one of their best players is Christian Walker, too. I feel like they just have more, uh, you know, of a complete team at this point of the season. And, and again, they believe. And when you can get teams that believe, you feel that energy, at least I do. You know, and when you feel it, it translates typically into good production. And good production typically translates to dubs. And, uh, you know, just because you're the Los Angeles Dodgers and you're a famous brand doesn't mean that you're going to be, you know, automatically making it to the World Series or the NLCS every single year. Plus, it's kind of nice to see a new team in there. I think he understands that they're not very good this year. Like, you could still win 100 games and win 100 and go 100 wins, 62 losses. But again, it's not about the record. How are you playing in the last 10 games going into the playoffs? And then are you continuing to play? Or are you that number one seed and you have a break for a week or a week and a half? Because what we've noticed in the National League, the teams that had the long break, it's hurt them tremendously. You know, so right now the Dodgers and the Braves don't look good. And they're both on the brink of getting eliminated, which they both will. But on the other side, the Astros, it hasn't phased them because they were hot going into the end. Same thing with the Rangers. And then the Orioles, we thought, with the Blue Jays and some of these other teams, we thought they would win at least a game. But it shows you American League and National League is, is, is a little bit different, you know, based off the pecking order of the, you know, top teams. And the Orioles, this was their first year, you know, being a good team. And sometimes when you have that lack of experience, it's hard for you to be able to overachieve and go all the way in your first year. But it is good uh, stepping stone, you know, for that moving forward. Exactly, exactly. You know, when you got Seawall going against Colton Wong, it was just hilarious because both guys were Mariners, and it's only fitting that whatever team has Colton Wong, yeah, that was the Wong move. Oh, baby, back, back, back. Gone, baby. Christian Walker, like I said, very, very underrated. He was very, very good this year. He's their home run hitter, and there it is. If you were going to win the first two games in Los Angeles, and you have no production out of Mookie or Freddie, what do you think is going to happen here at home? You know, if you're going to get rocked with Clayton Kershaw and he's going to give up like fucking a billion runs, you know, what, how does that set the tone that you're going to come back? You're not. Now, the real question is, can the Diamondbacks keep going and can they actually beat the Phillies? That's the real question. You know, Astros, Rangers, 50-50. Take your pick on going to the World Series. And I would say 95% of America will say Phillies if they get past the Braves. But there is a little chance, you know, if the Diamondbacks, it's not a good chance, but there's a little chance that the Diamondbacks overachieve and it would be a, a Cinderella story. But most Cinderella stories end, you know, in the ALCS or the NLCS. Will it, will it end for the Diamondbacks this year or will they surprise the hell out of everyone and be the Philadelphia Phillies of last year? I wouldn't count them out. They're playing great baseball right now. But definitely, I would have to say the Phillies would be the better team. But the Diamondbacks would be the cool story, though. But again, I don't want to see the Diamondbacks make it all the way to the World Series and then get swept by the Astros or Rangers. That would suck. Let's go, baby. Home run after home run after home run after home run. Let's go. 4-0 Diamondbacks. Let's go, baby. And also, too, uh, if you actually paid attention, you know, the Diamondbacks actually were in first place in the division a couple times this year. Uh-oh. Back, 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 back. Come on, baby. Solo shot after solo shot. What were they thinking? Lance Lynn? Yeah, it shows you if you don't have, you know, certain players out there, you know, it's like you, you got to make sure you have really, really good pitching. And also on top of that, not having Justin Turner there. They brought Kike Hernandez back, but, you know, not having, you know, Walker Bueller healthy, you know, a good version of Clayton Kershaw. You needed to have, you know, Urias. You need to make sure you have your best of your best going into the playoffs, not just throwing in randos, hoping that it's going to go well. They're trying, to, they're trying to do a discussion now to see if that was a foul or fair. Well, regardless, if they end up saying that it was a foul, the Dodgers are not coming back. Get the brooms.
Yeah, crew chief review. Make sure you get this right. All right, so now it's 3-0, but let's let's do the review. On the initial replay, it looked fair. But again, I need to see more camera angles here. Let's look again. Where the hell is the ball? That replay looked foul. Yeah, I think I think uh, the first replay where you didn't see the ball looked fair. That second replay looked foul, and then the third one looked foul. So I would assume that that is a foul ball. Yeah, it is foul. Yeah, it all depends on the camera angle that they show on TV, I think, too. The trajectory, and if the cameraman catches it, you know, as it's going either inside or outside of the pole. And I think if the cameras can't catch it in time, then it's obviously speculation, you know. But very clearly foul. But that's not going to save the Dodgers today. Uh-oh, back, 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 and that one is fair. He said, F you, you want, me, you want to take a home run away from me? I'll hit one on the next pitch, and that's when you know it is over for the Dodgers. Sorry, Dad. But again, you know, uh, I, I like Corbin Carroll a lot. He's more clutch than Julio. Paul Seawald is there, so I have a Mariner guy to root for. To tell Marte, I mean, I did a few Diamondback games this year, so I'm very familiar with the squad. And this is something that we were hoping that the Mariners were going to be able to do, you know, uh, in the American League. And uh, so we can live vicariously through the Diamondbacks because that's essentially who we were going to be. You know, that it is a very good comparison, Diamondbacks and the Mariners. So same thing you could also say like Orioles and Blue Jays, but they, they weren't able to uh, make it happen. But, I mean, like I said, talk about confidence. You know, and actually believing that, it, you know, who cares if we're playing the Dodgers? We're not playing the, you know, the team history. We're playing the Dodgers of 2023, which in essence isn't good. They're not good. You know, like I said, you can end up getting 100 wins, but in the last 10 games and going into the playoffs, you know, they didn't play good baseball. And it's definitely reflecting, you know, on how they're playing right now. Sad, you know, but I think my dad probably kind of saw this coming. And if not, then. It's a, a big slap in the face now. So now you know it's over. What did you end up wanting to see uh, for a photo, Sarah? I know you, I probably asked you a couple times. You got anything specific that you want to see baseball-wise? I got you. Yeah, but honestly, like I said, I don't know. I just sometimes get these gut feelings, you know, about things like when me and Elliot thought that the Raiders were going to, you know, beat the Packers. Do I like the Packers? No, I don't, right? But the thing is, it's like, besides me not liking them, it just felt like a trap game, you know, and, and even though they haven't won in like 20 years, you know, and I didn't know that going into that particular prediction, but sometimes you just get gut feelings that shit's going to happen. And uh, I, I had a feeling that, you know, Pedro was like, oh, the Dodgers are going to come back. And I was like, no, they're not going to come back. You know, you, you can be a professional pitcher and you can have your opinions and on here and there. But, you know, you got to do it based on how they're playing, you know, as of late. And on top of it, L.A. lost both games at home bad. So what would make me think that they were going to turn it around on the road? They weren't. So now is it still possible that the Dodgers come back and win this game? Yeah, but it's probably like a 1% chance. So. But again, the more sports you watch, the more re you know, reading you do, the more film study you do, and the more games you watch in entirety, you know, history tends to repeat itself. And sometimes a history is meant to be broken, and you see it in front of your very eyes. And I I'm really happy for the Diamondbacks. I wish it was the Mariners, but I'll take it. I'll live vicariously through Paul Seawald and his Diamondback team. But I would assume Phillies over the Diamondbacks in six. And then Astros and Rangers, it'll be 50-50. It could go either way. Rangers have been playing better, in my opinion, than the Astros. But Jordan Alvarez is on fire, and they have the experience. So, I mean, you're going based off the hottest, probably Rangers and Phillies. But, uh, you know, you can't count out the Astros based off their experience. And obviously, uh, 
you know, the, the team that has the least likely chance to make the World Series is this Arizona Diamondback team due to the inexperience and whatnot. But they're playing like, hey, you know, we're the real deal. I mean, I would love to see the Diamondbacks make history and end up, you know, winning, you know, them winning in six, but I just can't see them beating Philadelphia, especially with that crowd. You know, at some point your luck runs out and it typically runs out when you make it to like the NFC championship game, AFC championship game. Like when you're like one of those like surprise teams, like you can be really good, really good, really good, really hot, really healthy, but usually the luck runs out at the championship game itself or the game prior to the championship game. You know, so it's like, I feel that the run is special, but I think everyone in their, you know, everyone would be shocked if the Diamondbacks end up beating the Phillies, if the Phillies end up beating the Braves, they still got to get one more, but we'll see. Bottom of the third, 4-0, Arizona. It shows you how important pitching really is, and having that delay doesn't help a lot of teams. You know, it depends on if you have injury problems and guys can get healthy and if they're focused and they've been there before, like the Astros. But for whatever reason, the, the Braves and Dodgers got very complacent and the uh, Phillies and Diamondbacks played better baseball at the end of the year going into the playoff stretch. And then obviously continuing to play games after the regular season ended really benefited Arizona and Philadelphia and really hurt Atlanta and Los Angeles by taking that long extended break. But we will see what happens. Some Bryce Harper. Okay, let me get you some Bryce. And I know a lot of people don't like Bryce Harper. I've always liked him. You know, I know that some people thought he was like an asshole or like a villain. Uh, you know, and obviously some people thought that Mike Trout was just so much better and whatnot. But again, like Bryce has had more injuries uh, in his career. You know, and Mike Trout as of late has had the injuries kind of pile up, but stayed pretty much injury free. So everyone was like, "Yep, yeah, you know, Trout is better." Bryce Harper is kind of a flop, this or that, or, or I don't like him, or this or that. But I've always liked Bryce. I've never had a problem with him, you know, based on anything that I've watched. And I, honestly, he is that key piece that was missing to kind of get them over the top. I like rooting for him. And like I said, you know, I think he's got a certain personality. You know, I feel like he gets kind of a bad rap by the media. But uh, I don't buy into that bullshit. You know, I make my own opinions, and I've always liked him. And I think that Philadelphia was the perfect place for him. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the Phillies end up getting a World Series in the next five years. Could be as early as this year. And he's one of those magical players that can hit one, two, three home runs in a game and uh, really change the trajectory of a series. There's not many guys that are clutch, you know, like him. And he won't be clutch necessarily every game, but he, when he comes up big, he comes up big in big, big moments, like game-winning home run, two home runs in one game. Uh, and uh, I, I can really respect that. I like him a lot. Ninety five to go.
Hey, uh, you got to pump the brakes. You said Dodgers down. Who says that, that the Diamondbacks are beating Philadelphia? Like the Diamondbacks story is fantastic. I love me some Corbin Carroll, you know, and I like seeing Seawall do big things, but you just can't all of a sudden be like, oh, we beat the Dodgers and we're going to the World Series. Like you're not beating Philadelphia. Like the most wins that I think that they would get is two, you know, but it would probably be Philadelphia and five or Philadelphia and six, unless you know, you have injuries to Bryce Harper and, and, and maybe Wheeler, then maybe the Diamondbacks could end up winning then. But until that happens, I don't think anyone thinks that they're going to the World Series. But they are a hell of a good story this year. They're like the uh, National League version of what the Mariners were hoping to be. Jeff just automatically just skipped, just uh, skipped uh, <laughs> the Phillies and went boom, all the way to the World Series just right away. Little dribbler, four zero Diamondbacks. And momentum is real in sports. Like if you didn't think Uncle Mo was you know real, obviously watching the first two games, you already had that feeling. But again, if you're doing it based off team history and name, everyone was like Dodges, Dodges, Dodges. But the people that actually really watched them play late understood that there is a real fear that they could lose. And that's what we're seeing right now. The lack of depth and the lack of good pitching and good clutch hitting in the five through nine hole, and as well as Amuki and Freddie not playing good in this series. And, it, and it's killed the whole series altogether. Nice punch out. All right, Brandon. I see you, baby. Oh, really? Nice. You must be excited. There we go. Let me see. I'll throw up a photo for you, Judah. Costa with two, huh? logo too. I got you, bro. Let's go. How did you, how did you end up doing it last night? You ended up getting some of your money back, right? Nice.
Hell yeah. And then at some point, you know, obviously when the Kraken play, uh, you know, the Bruins, I'll definitely uh, do that matchup. But depending on what I end up uh, having on schedule, yeah, I might end up doing a, a Bruins, Bruins game at some point. So and you can educate me a little bit more on Bruins history and the, and the team. So I like being able to learn, you know, from different people, you know, based on their favorite teams and having a little bit better understanding. So we're in the bottom of the fourth four, zero Diamondbacks. Nice. There we go. Heck yeah. Did uh, Connor, did Connor, but, but dad, did he end up getting a, his first goal or no? I assume he didn't. Longoria in the box. The OG. Oh, he did. Good. First goal and then uh, first assist last night. Oh, good, good. Because I was going to say, I figured it would be like the second or third game that he would get his first goal, so. But sometimes even if you're a phenom coming in, it takes a little time, you know, to kind of get settled. And I figured assist in the first game, maybe assist in the second, and then in that third game, he'd probably get it done. But good. I'm happy that he got it done tonight. He got the goal, but you guys got the dub. Is he 18 or is he 19? Because I saw some kind of interview when, uh, you know, him and um, – Sidney Crosby, and obviously, you know, Crosby's 36, and at the time the interview took place, he was 18, but maybe he had a birthday. Maybe he's 19 now. Either way, he's super young. I think he's 18, bro. Because like I said, I saw, I saw an interview with both of them, and I know Crosby's 36, came in in 05, so with Ovechkin. I don't know when his birthday is. 18, there we go. So your boy knows. End of the fourth inning, 4-0 four, Diamondbacks. See if I can throw up a photo of him. He does look good in the jersey. I wouldn't mind doing actually some Chicago too to be able to check him out more. Ooh, baby. Fire. I imagine his memorabilia is going to be worth a lot, too. Like, a lot of people are scooping up a lot of PSA and PGS rookie cards, auto autos and everything. Because especially if he blows up, which he will, 
You want to be able to get that stuff cheap in the first couple of years before he turns into like megastar. And then if you wait too long, that's going to be like when it happened with Ovechkin and Sidney Crosby, where you could have gotten an auto rookie card graded for like a hundred to 200 bucks. And then if you wait a couple of years, then it's going to be like 400 bucks, 500 bucks. And then it's out of your price range. So. Yeah. And every once in a while, you'll get those people that are going to be worth, you know, the money. You just got to be able to find those phenoms, so. Brandon Fat, seven ground outs, four fly outs, only one strikeout, but he's doing enough to get the job done. It's kind of good. I see you, Brandon. Next up, Mad Max Muncie. Count is 02. We're in the top of the fifth. 4 0 Diamondback. Sorry, Dad. Ninety five to go. Pitch is high and inside, 2-2 two -two count. Oh, really? Who's the next phenom? Like, who's next up? Big swing and a miss. Got him. Big strikeout on Max Muncy there. Next up for the Dodgers, right fielder, Jason Haywood. I had the batting mixed up, Muncie and Smith. Uh oh, go, go, go. Will Smith with a stand up double. There we go. At least they're like fighting a little bit here. You're going to make a pitching change already? I mean, you're up 4 0, you know, and uh, obviously, let's see what, was, yeah. Wow, he didn't go through five, but what a hell of a start, man. Nice job. I know he wanted to be able to complete that, but what? He had one bad pitch in five innings, and he what, didn't even go for a homer, didn't even go for a triple, but obviously, you got to go with uh, the gut feeling and, uh, I, I don't know if I uh, disagree with that either. Yeah, but if he is an actual diehard Dodger fan and he's watched this team all year, you know, just like I have and my dad has, you know, you kind of get to a point where you realize that you're outmatched. You know, if your superstars don't come to play, pitching is terrible, you know, the other team is hot, you know, and you're at home and you can't even win games, then you know you're screwed, so. Yeah, but again, they, they've had their run. A couple years ago, they were the best team in baseball for like three years. So maybe they'll be able to get back to that point in the future. But I think the writing was already kind of on the wall. Mookie or Freddie, uh, I think, believe that they both were uh, 0 for whatever. You know, I saw the graphic. They both were like 0 for 8 or 0 for 7. Both of them didn't have a hit. So if you're at home and you're supposed to be a 100-plus win team, and you're supposed to be the second best team besides the Braves, and you don't have a hit with either one of your Hall of Famers, like, how are you supposed to win? And the answer is you don't. A 
little Mookie bats. Yeah. <laughs> See, Matt, I told you, man, like I said, you just got to be able to find an outlet for, you know, some of your, you know, you know, wide receiver, tight end, route running uh, knowledge of, you know, football. And like I said, if you start like a Twitter X, uh, you know, type of account, you know, you can post stuff on there or you can post stuff on my videos. But you're getting a better response than I think that you anticipated. You figured that you would be doing these long paragraphs and novels and you were hoping that you would get, you know, me to like it and then at least like a couple people to like it. But some posts, you're not going to get a response. You know, I'll, I'll usually like most of the posts from most of the people on there as long as it's legit. Um, you know, but then you're also getting responses from, you know, newbies or people that are watching the reaction videos. So again, you, you just need to be able to, you know, put the information in the right spot, you know. Uh, I only have one. I have one pup, Paisley. My Paisley pup. I mean, she's two years old now, but she'll still be a pup to me forever. So this is what she looked like when I first got her. Um, obviously the sweetest thing ever. And she's an American Staffordshire Terrier. She's the sweetest thing ever. She's so intelligent, so loving, so sweet. And uh, like I said, I've been, you know, walking her nonstop and we've been exercising and I got her to drop about 15 pounds. So now she's in the wheelhouse of the correct weight of around 54 pounds, 55. For females, they're about 45 to 60. And then I think for males, it's like 50 to 70, somewhere in that general range. So. Got the trainer looking at his hand here real quick. Yeah, and like I said, if you end up, you know, doing, like, I, honestly, if you end up creating a Twitter account, it's free, right? And then you just find highlights, and then you just put, you know, you reply to it above it, and then you give your little take, you will get results off that, you know what I mean? And obviously, the more intelligent that you are and stuff that you have there, you know, it'll get a response. You just have to start doing it, and then you can start gaining a following. You know, sometimes it's like you just got to be able to know where to be able to put things to, you know, get the proper appreciation and whatnot, you know. It's like if I would have never did YouTube and I did like, you know, Facebook and these other platforms, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, so. Nah, they're just the better team. They're hot and they're healthy. Yeah, damn, that is a big ass bruise. It's like, just tough it out, dude. He's like, I'm tough. I don't care if I got bruises. I'm going to keep going. Four zero, Arizona. Top of the fifth, runner at second, 1-1 one, one count. I mean, essentially the game is already over, but four more innings until the sweep is complete.
I mean, shit, I wish Julio could be a little bit more like Corbin Carroll and be a little bit more clutch. And hopefully in a few years he will be. I mean, obviously defensively, I like what Julio does. Stealing bags, I like what he does there. But in the box, he's got a long ways to go. He's kind of good. Yeah, definitely rookie of the year, no doubt. Not even close. Top of the fifth, 4-0 Arizona. Runner at second. One-two pitch. Big swing and a miss. See you later. Two away. Yeah, starters have been terrible. Plus, just mentally, you know, if you're Kershaw and you, you're giving up like six, seven, eight, nine runs in that first game, you know you're fucked. Like, you, you already know there's no coming back. Like, you know, and plus, like, you shouldn't even have Kershaw be the first one pitching. You know, if you had better players, like if you had Walker Bueller, you know, and you had some of the others, you know, May, but uh, there's so many injuries. It's like they never can have their four best pitchers at the end of the year. It's just like, you know, one or two that are pretty good and then and then a couple other guys that they just have to throw in there and pray. And that's what happened with Lynn today, and they got rocked. Oh, wow, that is easy. One, one pitch. Popped up. Guriel. Routine play, one, two, three. Let's go to the bottom of the fifth inning. I know, I'm pretty crazy. But again, you know, certain teams, you know, you just can't just be like, oh, you know, we have this storied history. We're going to win just because we're the Dodgers or we're the Yankees. You know, it doesn't work like that anymore. You got to be hot and healthy at the right time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think some people thought they would put up at least something, but I mean, Uncle Mo and that momentum is real. And once momentum starts going and you win two games on the road and then you're coming back home to like a, you know, a very rowdy fan base that's excited that you're there, then I mean, it's not like you're just going to collapse and then, you know, lose when you've been the better team in the first two games and the better team going into the playoffs. So. You know, but some people like, you know, Pedro Martinez, you know, maybe, you know, maybe he, you know, had some type of insight. But again, you have to do it based on how the games and the flow of the games have been going. So, I mean, nothing, nothing has, you know, been done to make anyone think that the Dodgers were going to do anything this postseason. So great regular season team, but just because you're a great regular season team doesn't mean you're going to get things done in the postseason, unfortunately, for, for the Dodgers. I'm going to go check up on Paisley here real quick. Give me like 30 seconds to a minute, and I'll be right back. Go check up on my pup.
All right, I'm back. She's sleeping on the couch, just relaxing. Put a little blanket on her. She's good. Goats, where are you? I knew 2023 might, uh, you know, be challenging, but challenging isn't even the right, correct word to use. Corbin Carroll in the box, must see TV. Pitches outside. 3 0 count. Rookie of the year right there. Stud. Three one count. Bottom of the fifth, four zero Diamondbacks. 3 1 pitch from Ferguson, and he walked him. Next up for the Diamondbacks, Cattell Marte. And the Astros won 3-2. It wasn't pretty, but it was a win. I get a different Marte photo, something better. Elliot in the building. What's good, brother? d backs are down, man. The first time I think I've not rooted for the Dodgers in, in a postseason. But again, I, you know, I got the Paul Seawald connection. I do love Corbin Carroll. You know, I felt that the Dodgers were frauds going in. And uh, obviously my, my, my gut feeling was correct, just like when we predicted that the Raiders were going to beat the Packers. You know, and even when the Diamondbacks were playing the Dodgers in game one, Preston wanted to call me out like I'm an idiot, like I don't know what I'm talking about, you know. I was like, Doug, they ain't winning that shit, and they didn't. So, you know, but again, you can always tell, you know, the person that ends up watching a little bit more than someone else, 
you know, and sometimes it's a little luck. Sometimes it's a little ESP, but you know, if I, if, you know, the person that reads more and watches more film and watches more complete games, you're, you're going to be able to predict, you know, more correctly and uh, more often. So it's crazy though, that in that rate of game, uh, Elliot, did you know that was like the first time that they beat the Packers in like 15 to 20 years? I didn't realize that when we made the prediction, but like I said, I don't got a whole lot of love for Green Bay, and it did feel like a trap game. Plus, where my fantasy is on the line and everything, the sports gods listen. I didn't get the fantasy win, but at least we got the Ura to win. He takes the underdogs and pulls them out all the time. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just got to be able to find the right scenario, so. Right to first base, flip, one away. Corbin Carroll, the third. Yeah, I didn't realize that they, yeah, you know, that was the first time they've won in like 10, 15, 20 years against Green Bay. But, I mean, you got to think about it. when's the last time the Raiders were good? Like back in the early 2000s when they went to the Super Bowl against my Bucks, you know, with Rich Cannon. So, like, that's the last time they were, like, good, good. So, maybe that was the last time that they actually beat them as around that time. It, it makes sense. Yeah, but also, too, it's like, you know, the Chiefs haven't been playing uh, good football. So, yeah, they're the Kansas City Chiefs, but this is the weakest version of the Chiefs that we've seen with Mahomes in like three, four, five years, right? So if you know the team doesn't look the same, yes, they might be that famous Kansas City Chiefs, and you might have some dog shit team like the Jets, but if we're talking about betting, maybe not winning, but maybe the game ends up being a little bit closer, especially if that dog shit team that goes against the powerhouse team has a good defense, which the Jets do. I mean, you just got to be able to look at all those type of factors, you know, home, away, you know, who's playing decent football. You know, I'm not sure if anyone anticipated Zach Wilson playing the way that he did, but again, you know, sometimes finding those, those matchups and not being, uh, you know, enamored and, and falling in love with just a team's history. You know, you're not playing the Dodgers in their hundred year history. You're playing the Los Angeles Dodgers of 2023, who is not a good team right now. You know, and if you put it in that type of mind frame, then you can believe in yourself and believe you're going to win. And the Diamondbacks came in saying that, you know what, we, we were you know pretty good against this team in the regular season. And the Diamondbacks held first place, you know, in the National League West uh, for a few games a couple times throughout the year. So it's not like they're intimidated by this team. You watched the first two episodes of Quarterback? Oh, golly, you should have watched that already, bro. It's it's very good. It'll make you respect Kirk Cousins and Mariota more. Like, it's cool that, about Mahomes, as long as you don't have to see Jackson in there and you get to see the wife and the trainers and how he talks to family and the players, right? But I think the main thing that you got from it is it makes Kirk Cousins a lot more likable and a guy that you can root for. Same thing with Marcus Mariota. And, you know, not everyone's going to be a Patrick Mahomes. The picks are hard to, yeah. Well, that's what happens when you're an underdog. So Green Bay threw the pick and the line was two. Wow. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys, uh, you know, you know the tendencies and you know what to, to look for to win that money. So it's something that I probably should do with my sports knowledge, you know, especially reading and watching film every day, covering every single team and all the four major sports the best that I can especially with basketball, baseball, and football. I feel like I know pretty much everything. On hockey, I have a lot to learn. On NASCAR, I, I still have some you know, stuff to learn. But you know, as far as like wrestling, AEW, WWE, I, I mean, I got that on lock. And then basketball, baseball, football, and college football, I got that on lock too. So. But anything that I can learn on the NASCAR and NHL side, I'm, I'm all ears. Oh, for sure. But it's not going to be with Minnesota. And now you got Jay Jetta with the fucking hammy and like fucking up my fantasy team. Like I'm looking at my fantasy team and like three of my top guys I might not even be able to use. Jay Jetta fucking with the hammy on IR. That was my number one pick. Then Amon Ra was my second pick and he's injured. And then Mike Evans is hurt. Like Jesus Christ, like what the hell am I supposed to do? But I mean, luckily I'm smart enough to be able to climb out of a hole and I can manufacture, you know, a team. But 
you can't replicate Jay Jetta, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Mike Evans' numbers when they're healthy. Because when those guys are healthy, those three guys could put up 100 points for me. So it's like, how do you replace that? I mean, yeah, I got Hollywood Brown, but he's going to probably put up like a 15 to an 18, not a 35. You know, and I'm, if I'm playing a really good team in fantasy, that might be the difference. So, Haven Smith in the box. He just put in the under for the Denver game. I think Russell Wilson, it's a trap game. I'm not saying that the, the Broncos are going to win because their defense is terrible, but in the same scenario, like in that Jets game, might happen where the Denver defense is dog shit. The Jets defense was good, but maybe Denver's offense is going to be better than the Jets offense. And maybe the Chiefs make some bonehead plays. And maybe, you know, I would assume Mahomes has a good game. He better. He's my fantasy quarterback. You know, but maybe instead of him throwing for, you know, four or five touchdowns, maybe it's a little bit more neutral where it's like two, you know, or maybe three. Or maybe he runs one in and maybe has one or two passing instead of like five touchdowns passing, which would be great for me. I need points. You know, I got him and CJ Stroud, so. And if Mahomes starts struggling, I won't have a problem putting in CJ, but I can't have CJ put up a 10, then three 20s, and then like a 14. I need more consistency. You know, I need, I need to be able to see like 18 and higher like every game, you know, moving forward. Like I can't have you throwing up a 10 or a 14, not when I have Mahomes. So, you know. The Giants versus Seattle, yeah. You just got to be able to look at the shit team and see if they have any positives. Like, does the shitty team that have zero wins or one win or two wins, they play a good team. Yes, they're going to lose, but they might be able to cover the spread, and maybe they upset, like with the Raiders, you know. A lot of times, too, I feel it's like with the sports gods, if I say it out loud or I make a prediction and it comes true. Like, I, I feel like I have better... ESP than any other YouTuber that's out there. Anyone that watches the broadcast on a regular basis. I mean, I usually will have one or two ESP moments a game, no matter what I'm doing. But some games, it's like a lot where I'll, you know, have like many, many predictions that come true. But again, it's, you know, a lot of times I'm looking for things. And if I see tendencies and I've seen it before, then it makes it easier for me to predict because I've seen it, you know, and obviously I've watched a lot of film. I, you know, do about four five, six hours of reading every day, a couple hours of film you know, covering all 32 teams on the NFL side, college football, and then heavy, heavy coverage on baseball and obviously on the NBA side. So, but one thing that I've ever, I've never done though, is I've never capitalized on betting. You know, I just haven't had the extra money to do it, but maybe I should. Cause I honestly think I could, I could end up being one of those like, you know, people that ends up winning big, big, you know, but you got to have money to make money. Yeah, also, you got to look to see where the games are being played. You know, is the game at home or is it on the road? And even though Miami played awesome at home against a shitty Denver, right? You're now you're going on the road and you're not as good. So, and then obviously, you got to look at certain teams like Buffalo at home is almost impossible to beat. Kansas City at home is almost impossible to beat. Can you beat them? Yes, but you have to play like a magnificent game because you have to fight the momentum in the crowd. But sometimes when you end up throwing up a 70 burger on a shitty team, you're like, Miami is going to find a way to beat Buffalo because they have injuries on the defense and they're just going to go in there and they're going to slap them up like they did with Denver. But then you have to start to realize when you make bets, Denver and Buffalo are two of, you know, two teams that have no similarities. One team might actually make the Super Bowl. The other one's going to get a, probably a top six pick. So base is loaded. Guriel in the box. Even pitch. Pitch is low. 3-1 count. They're about to force a run in just by a walk. It's about to be 5-0 here in a second or more. Uh, you know what? I'm helping out a guy, Mo Gumball, on the channel, do betting for a sports bar to get, you know, it's just straight up every week. And I'm in the top three people win money and he just wants the notoriety and he just wants the, the, you know, the pub, he just wants the respect and then I'll get the money. But uh, some of these picks that you picked, I did, I did the same thing. 
I fucked up. And I thought, you know, maybe Miami would be able to hang on to that momentum. And I, I did pick Miami to win against Buffalo. I did the same thing. And then I also did Bills over the Jags as well. You know, I did the same thing. But again, you can't predict injuries. So home and away is completely different. You know, it's like you have to understand when you win a big game at home, if you go to London or you're going on the road in the next game, that there is a chance that even if the team isn't as good, that they're just going to win because they're the home team. And Jacksonville was already there for a week, you know, and then obviously playing two weeks there. So I think that's the one thing that'll help you in betting, you know, is that you can't assume that momentum will shift one week to the next unless the games are both at home. But if you, as soon as you win one big game at home and then you go to London or you go on the road, even if you're playing a shittier team than you, there is a possibility that you just don't play the same way. The other team plays better and then you end up making some costly mistakes and then you lose. So if you can have that in your memory bank, like knowing that, okay, okay, the Bills won here. Okay, but now they're going to London. I know they're better than Jacksonville, but they're going to be jet lagged. And, it, you know, in our heads, we're like, Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo. But again, sometimes it's that team that's already there that's not jet lagged. They're not as good as Buffalo, but Buffalo had injuries on the defense. Trevor started playing better. They didn't stop EPN. And then they couldn't stop Ridley. And then the game is over. So uh, a lot of times with betting, that's the number one way to counteract losing money in bets. Only bet for that strong team is if the next game is at home and you have a good feeling about it. But as soon as that good team goes on the road, don't bet on that team. You have to bet on the other. Unless it's just like an incredibly dog shit team that has no chance, you know, like the Giants or, or something of that nature, then you already know it don't matter if it's home or on the road. The Bills are beating the Giants. I don't give a shit if the game is played in Buffalo in New York, in London, in Japan, in Australia, in my fucking neighborhood, right? you know, it don't matter. You know, Buffalo, when they play New York, that New York has 0% chance to win, zero. You know, so unless it's like one of those, then you can do the road matchup. But I think, you know, if you put that, you know, in your memory bank, that'll help you win more money. Yeah, but also you got to look at travel and jet lag. One team was already there and played, so they already have an advantage of being settled in. And then another team is coming off, you know, uh, obviously a win, and then you're going all the way and playing actually a playoff team. But just most people think the Jags are not that good. Or we thought that, that maybe they would be able to contain Ridley and ETN, and that wasn't the case. So it's not like Trevor was like, oh, my God, Trevor. You know, it was more ETN that game, and you couldn't have predicted that. But that's also important to look at the injury report. You have to be able to look at the injury report and, you know, be able to go through there. Like with me in fantasy, I make like 50 moves uh, within the first couple of weeks. I'm already at like 40 or 50 moves. I'm always continuing to look for the gems before other people snag them. I'm always looking ahead in the schedule. I'm always looking for insurance. I'm never having a piece on my bench that is sitting there collecting dust. I always make sure I have every piece I would consider playing that week. And if I don't, then I'm not on my game. And then someone else is going to steal a piece. You know, so I'm always looking to improve and I don't go based off name recognition. Hell, I got, a, you know, a Jim Ricardo from fucking the Cardinals with the James the Terminator Kana injury, you know, and uh, picking up fucking KJ Osborne. Do I think KJ Osborne is going to be phenomenal? Probably not. But what I do know is that the Vikings throw the most out of any team in football, which most people don't. They throw like 40 times a game. So that means with no Adam Thielen there or Dalvin Cook stealing looks, that it's only going to be Hawkinson, Jordan Addison, and him. So I already know that even if you know Jordan Addison is getting a lot, number one look, and then Hawkinson's getting number one looks, I'm going to get enough that if I have injuries with Mike Evans and and if I have injuries with you know some of my guys like Jay Jetta uh, and Amon Ross St. Brown, I can take a chance and throw in a KJ Osborne at the appropriate time, and he might put up 12 to 25 points for me but I have to be very selective on when I play them. I just can't throw them in there, especially if I got guys that are better, you know, and that's how you end up being uh, a monster at fantasy or at betting. So, Falcons versus the commanders. And that is like a trap game because I feel like Falcons and Ritter at home, he, he's going to be better, you know, but the thing is with the commanders, you don't really know what kind of commander uh, team you're going to get. You know, are you going to get your ass kicked on national television? Are we getting that commanders? Or are we getting the commanders that almost beat the Eagles in overtime? You know, so it's like you don't really know. And that's why the NFL is so hard to pick because it's the league that is so close to each other. The elite teams 
and the good teams are marginalized only by a couple points. And the only difference is the dog shit team, right, compared to the elite. Got him at first. But the thing is, is even a dog shit team, right, even a blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while. So even a dog shit team that has zero wins or one win or two wins can beat. Like, if the Broncos beat the Chiefs, I would not be as surprised. Like, what if Russell Wilson plays his Super Bowl game this Thursday? And he ends up throwing for three touchdowns, no picks. And all of a sudden, Mahomes has two touchdowns, two picks. And what happens if, you know, they have a couple fumbles with Pacheco or McKinnon? Shit that we're not expecting to happen, right? And then all of a sudden, the game is a little closer than people think. And then all of a sudden, it's a field goal. And then they, they, uh, the Broncos win 23-20. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But scenarios like that in sports happen all the time. And that's why it's very difficult to predict sometimes. Seattle at Cincy, right? Seattle is the better team, but Cincy is hot. What Cincy uh, team are you going to get? The Burrow with the Jamar Chase that we saw last week? Or are we going to get a, an amazing Seattle Seahawks team? I mean, I don't think anyone really knows. That one is 50-50. You know, you would assume that Cincinnati with home field, but if they play like they did the first couple weeks of the season, Seattle by a billion. But if Cincy plays like they did last week, it'll probably go down to the wire. And it could end up being a very close game settled by four points or less. So. Yeah, and also, too, you got to look at uh, rivalry games within the division. If the games are being played within the division, sometimes the records go out the window, unless you're like the Giants. But if it's like the Commanders and the Cowboys and the Eagles, any scenario could happen. Yes, we know the Eagles are one of the top two teams in football with the Niners, but that doesn't mean that they might slip up or someone gets hurt unexpectedly, like A.J. Brown or Fletcher Cox or you know, uh, you know, somebody, and then a big play slay, and then all of a sudden that injury ends up leading that other team to exploit the weakness, you know, and then they end up winning the game barely, you know, by like a field goal at the end. That's why NFL is so hard to predict. Niners in Cleveland. Oh, Niners. You already know it, dude. Saints uh, and Texans. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Obviously, you would assume the Saints are going to win. They're starting to be able to pick up on that momentum. But uh, remember, the Texans are not the New England Patriots. You know, they, they got, you know, Damian Pierce. They, their line is improving, right? They got Tank Bell, right? You, you got a lot of different, you know, pieces there. Nico Collins. You know, they got Dalton Schultz, the former Cowboy. The, the defense actually has been decent at time. So, it, like, I w if the Texans win that game, would I be shocked? You know, no. You know what I mean? The Saints should win, but it, they have to put pressure and make CJ play average. And, uh, you know, if there is a team to get that first pick, yeah, it could be definitely uh, Nolens this weekend. But again, anyone can look good when you play that particular team. And New England Patriots, like you know, is your team. They look like dog shit that game. You know, they look terrible. You know, especially if you don't got Judon, you don't got Christian Gonzalez, the offense is shaky. You know what I mean? It's like you should have had uh, Jacoby Myers, but you settled for Juju. Ramondre Stevenson, I had him in fantasy, and I had to drop him because he's not consistent. Zeke is not that much better. Like, nothing is really going for you and the Patriots, Judah. And that's not me being a hater. That's just me being honest. You know, but some people take shit personally when I say this team is better than this or this team is playing like dog shit. I just, I speak facts. I just tell the truth on based on what I feel, you know. You know, and some people will agree with me, you know, you know, based off pecking order, you know, Niners, Eagles, Lions, and then, you know, obviously Seahawks, Bucks, like, you know. But again, some people like Reflect and, and Megan will think Seahawks are better than the Lions and I'll think that the Lions are better. And even if the Buccaneers, you know, at, you know, three and one, four and one record, if we end up you know, beating the Lions by 20, I still think the Lions are the better team. And I think, you know, just because I, maybe I beat them one on one, who's got a better chance to win games in the playoffs? The Bucs? Who could with Baker? Seattle with Geno? Or what we've seen with Goff and the Lions and Aiden Hutchinson? And I think that, I mean... Everyone can have their own opinion, you know, like Reflect and, and Megan and whatnot. But for me, not being biased at all and just being able to look at a team from beginning to end, uh, I mean, I'm going to not agree with everyone all the time. But what I do feel is that if you ask people that aren't Hawks or Lions fans and you just say straight up, who is, you know, the third best team in the NFC based on the eye test and what you've seen, you know, from all the games, who has looked the best? And I think that a lot of people would agree with me that the Lions are the third best team. They have the most balance. They got a better O-line and D-line. And ultimately, sometimes that ends up being my deciding factor. You know, I got to be able to see the weapons that you have, the coach, and the vibe. Even though Seattle did beat the Lions one-on-one, -on -one, 
Yes, they did. But I don't think that they've been playing better football from week one to week five, week six, compared to what I've seen with Detroit. You know, but again, everyone's going to have their uh, own opinion. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to be able to be a people pleaser for everyone. I just have to be able to be honest. So some people can take my honest opinion. They can say, oh, Ryan, you're being biased. But am I really? Do I like the Lions and the Niners? Yeah. But just because I like a team, right, doesn't mean that they're going to be good or they're going to be able to play as good as I'm saying. You know, because in years past, the Lions have always been lovable losers. But this is the first time where they actually look like they can make the playoffs, that they actually can win around. And depending on who they play, if the Niners and the Eagles play each other prior to the NFC Championship game, the Lions actually overachieving and making an NFC Championship game in the next three years doesn't sound crazy. Now, if I would have said that last year, they'd be like, oh, dog, that's a little bit of a reach. Uh, besides the last like five or six games that the Lions played, they, they showed potential. But now, Goff, Montgomery, you know, Gibbs, Josh Reynolds, Amon Ra, you know, Laporta, you know, the offensive line with Penny Sue and Ragnow, right? And then Aiden Hutchinson was playing like a top five defender like Max Crosby. Certain things cannot be ignored. You know, if certain things have to be able to be, you know, seen. It's like, I know Matthew Dudon is one of the best players in the NFL, but how many other fans agree with that statement? Not many, unless you're a New England fan or a Judon fan. You know, I, I look at talent and I try to take the team out of it. But if it ends up being a team that, you know, I've rooted for as a kid, like, then, you know, the nine, this is the first time that the fucking uh, Lions and the Niners at the same time have been good. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, this is the first time in a long time. I mean, besides that occasional, you know, Megatron year, like one out of every four to five years, the Lions win the division or get a wild card. But back then, they were frauds. They didn't have the complete package. Now they got Goff. Now they got, you know, Dan Campbell. They got the right running back. They got the right receivers. They got Laporta. The line is great. The D-line is great. Obviously, the secondary with some of the injuries with C.J. Gardner-Johnson, that hurt with the ski mask, right? But besides that, um, I like balance in football teams too. And I thought the Saints were going to be the third best team, but instead of it being the Saints, it ended up being the Detroit Lions because I like teams in the NFC that have balance. In the AFC, they have the Hall of Fame quarterbacks, but their defenses are ass, right? So they have to rely on that offense outscoring the more well-balanced defense. But on, the, but on the NFC side, Niners, Eagles, Lions, Saints, if the Saints offense can just fucking get it going, Dennis Allen, Carmichael, that O-line. But, you know, they have that potential to be, like, in the same category as the Lions. You know, and then you got teams like Tampa and Seattle, I feel, are below because they don't have as much balance on both sides of the ball just yet. We, we have some, you know, like I got Tristan Wirfs. He's arguably one of the best left tackles besides, you know, Trent Williams. Based off numbers, he's playing like it, and he played at right tackle. So, you know, and then Antoine Winfield Jr., my, my safety is a top five already. You know, like, you know, you got some pieces, but just because you have some doesn't mean you have the complete, you know? That's how I evaluate, you know, because obviously if I would be biased, I'd be like, oh, Buccaneers are the best team. You know, I'd be like, oh, the Bucs, you know, we could beat the Eagles, we could beat the Niners, you know? But again, even if we beat like the Seahawks do to Detroit this weekend with the creamsicles, I am still going to think the Lions are the better team long term. And if I was biased, I would never say something like that, right? I would be like Tampa, 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 Bucks, you know. But again, everyone will have you know their own opinions. But I think I, with my information and the way that I see sports. I can predict more than the average person. I think I can predict better than anybody that's on YouTube. And like I said, I'm not going to be always right. I'm going to be wrong, just like everyone else. But I feel I can be more right and give you kind of certain insight that maybe certain people aren't seeing. I take the team equation out of it. I, you know, I just look at greatness. You know, I, I was like, okay, I'm a Mariner fan, but if I don't think that we're legit and the Astros and Rangers are better, I'm not going to just be like, Mariners, fuck them. You know, every, everybody else is better. Mariners, number one. You know, I'm not delusional. I got to keep it real. That's what gives me credibility. You know, the, of course, am I going to root for the Mariners and the Blazers and the Ducks, uh, you know, and the Buccaneers? Yes. But if I think someone's better, you know, I'm going to keep it real, you know, because that's what people need to hear. People need to hear not biased takes. You guys get that on TV and podcast already to actually get someone to say something that not everyone's going to agree with. But I think a lot of NFL fans will agree with me on certain takes that I have that I feel like the Lions are the third best team. Like, hell, I think the Lions are even better than Miami. Honestly, it's like you got, you got, you know, you got obviously with the Niners and you got the Eagles. And then most people will have the Chiefs and then like Miami and then the Lions. But 
for me, uh, at this point, I think I like Detroit more because I can trust their defense more than I can trust the Miami defense. Now, my, the Miami offense is explosive. They're a track team. They're amazing. But at certain points, if they play a team that's got a same kind of offense or somewhat of a defense, Miami will lose. They're not going to just be able to overpower you, you know, just yet. It's coming. Like maybe Miami will have its shine, but at this point, I don't think they're better necessarily uh, than Buffalo week in and week out or Kansas City week in and week out. But if their defense was there, then Miami could be considered the number one team in the AFC, but the defense is not there. But maybe one day it will be. You know, sometimes we got to look past popularity, Bills, Chiefs, and actually just look at the tape and uh, say, is this team playing good? Not, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the Swifties and Travis Kelsey. Can we honestly say that they are playing the same way they did when Mahomes was winning championships? And the answer is no. Are they winning? Yes, but they're winning ugly. So it shows that, like, if there's a crack in the wheel, it's this year. So that the AFC is not going to win the Super Bowl. I mean, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that. You know, fuck, the Eagles should have won it last year. I've gotten every Super Bowl winner right for people betting 20 years in a row. My first loss last year because the Eagles fucking didn't get any sacks or picks. I couldn't predict that. I thought they were going to play like Aaron Donald and the Rams. I thought they were going to play like my Buccaneers against Mahomes when I ended up winning the Super Bowl, right? He didn't even throw a touchdown pass. And the offense and Jalen was great, but the O-line and the D-line played like dog shit. You know, and you can't have a shitty O-line and a shitty D-line. Like, literally the MVP of the Super Bowl wasn't Patrick Mahomes. It wasn't, you know, Andy Reid. It was the fucking Chiefs offensive line. But you don't hear anybody on fucking social media saying that. You know, everyone's like, oh, Mahomes, oh, Kelsey, Andy Reid. And the O-line was supposed to be the weakest thing about that team. And it ended up being the MVP and the reason why they won. Facts. See, it's all about perception and how you see the game. It's like when you watch football, are you watching the ball and watching the offensive players? Or are you like me watching the defensive side? And only like 1% of fans watch it that way. Like I can watch a game from the offensive point of view, and then I can actually watch it from an offensive lineman point of view, and then you can watch it from a defensive linebacker point of view. Next time you watch a game, watch your favorite linebacker on your team. Watch the leader on the defense, either the D-tackle or the linebacker, and watch them move on the field before you watch the ball being snapped. You know, you can always follow the ball, but once you watch a game from a defensive perspective, it's like watching the game on a whole other level. Like, I literally can watch the same game twice, and it's different because you're actually watching the guys who's good in man coverage, who's good in press, who's good in fucking nickel and dime, who's actually running from sideline to sideline. You know, defense is one of those things that's underappreciated, but it wins championships, you know. But that's one thing that I've learned to, to do better predictions is that I watch that side of the ball first. Watch the O-line, watch the D-line, and watch the linebacker call the, you know, the audibles and go from there. Just don't watch the center go to the quarterback, hand it off to the running back, because that's how 99% of people watch football. But if you really want to understand the game, watch the O-line and the D-line so you can see who's pancaking, who's pulling, who is that Pro Bowl, All-Pro offensive lineman, who, who are the studs on defense that people aren't talking about, like Demario Davis, a.k.a. the glue. You know, That's why I'm able to vibe, I think, with more fans than, than most people, because I understand the game on another level, and I can understand and vibe with every fan base, because I'm not going to hate. Uh, I'm going to give you your love and your and your flowers for your good players. That like Demario Davis is probably the most disrespected linebacker on planet Earth and has been for like the last five years. But do you hear any social media outlet say anything about the fucking Saints or him? It's always fucking Lattimore or Cameron Jordan. Fucking uh, Demario Davis's name isn't even fucking out there. It's, it's fucking sickening, you know. But that's why I have this channel where I can educate you guys so that way you're like, goddamn. Like, if you're a Saints fan, you're really vibing with me. You're like, oh, this motherfucker knows. You know, but if I'm, if you're not a Saints fan, then you're like, damn, like, this guy's really going deep, you know? Anyone can watch a game black and white. It's seen in the gray area. And that's how you became a good fantasy player, a good better, and obviously you understand the game on another level. Uh, it all depends with injuries. I got to see if Amon Ra or Mike Evans is playing. I assume Mike Evans is going to sit out with the hammy. So I, I would be taking the Lions over Tampa, even though Tampa is my own team. Well, it's the perfect team to play if you're the Cowboys, because even though you're not at home, the Chargers always choke on defense, right? And they always have injuries. 
So it's like that team that should win 10, 11, 12 games every year with Herbert, but Eckler always gets hurt. Oh, Mike Williams is already hurt out for the year. You know what I mean? It's like every single spot, you always have an injury on the O-line. Oh, Khalil Mack. Oh, injured. Oh, 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 Joey Bosa. Injured. Oh, Derwin James. Injured. Like the only one you can count on not getting hurt is Asante Samuel Jr., who's a stud, right? So, but, uh, again, that game could go both ways. We could end up seeing the Chargers blow them out, or maybe the Cowboys bounce back after that terrible loss to the Niners. So, five doll hairs. Is that good? Like, that's why I feel like a lot of the bigger outlets like, uh, you know, Good Morning Football, NFL Network, EA Sports and Madden, uh, Pat McAfee Show, CBS Sports, Fox Sports, ESPN, they know who all the YouTubers are, you know, that do content. They know. You know, they know who's smart and who just does it for entertainment. They know who's dumb and just does it for entertainment, and they know the people that are really smart and what chats are smart. They know what channels are smart and the ones that are for entertainment or ones that actually know football or know sports or wrestling. So. But I feel that, like, you know, the people that are a part of this channel, you can learn a lot more here from me and the people in the room than any other sport or wrestling channel that's out there. You know, it's just a matter of time before we, you know, we hit the algorithm and then people start giving, uh, you know, the proper respect that we deserve here. Right. You never know, though. You know, football is week to week, and that's what makes it so special. Yeah, and that's how you hide some of the weaknesses that you guys have, is that you got AK-41 back, so you hand the ball off more, knowing that you're actually getting yards, not like when you handed it off to Jamal and he got one yard. You already know, you know, AK-41 Alva Kamara can get – you know, 80 to 120 yards and two touchdowns uh, or 75 yards in a tutty. It's like you're not going to get too many AK-41 games where he's got 18 carries for 25 yards. I mean, there's going to be certain games where he does get exposed with a really, really good D-line. But, you know, if you have a good running game, that'll open up the offense, give Carr more time or whoever the hell the quarterback is. But, you know, but it shows you how important certain players are. But bottom line, Dennis Allen needs to be fired. He's a defensive coordinator, not a head coach. Carmichael, an uh, offensive coordinator, needs to go. And um, Carr has not played very well this season. And uh, you have to rely on the defense to try to keep things moving. And the O-line has been terrible. And normally that's a strong suit for the Saints. So obviously if the O-line is good, which I thought it was going to be good, and uh, play calling and head coaching would be better, then the Saints should have been where the Lions are right now. They should have been the third best team or fourth best team. But now they're looking up at the Bucks. Uh, the Seahawks and the Lions. And the Eagles and Niners, of course. Throw to first, one away. Cardinals, Rams. It's a divisional game. Who knows who's going to win that one? You don't know. You don't know what kind of game you're going to get there. And that's why you got to look at fantasy and you got to look at the injury report, too. LG in the building, what's good? Yeah, but I think a, a lot of times, I think my picks and my opinions get misconstrued. Like, the, you know, it's like if I uh, talk about the Lions and the Niners, because, you know, obviously I, I like the Niners when I was a kid and I've always liked the Lions, but it just so happens that they're just really, really good this year. You know, because in years past, it's not like I'm going to be like, oh yeah, the Lions are going to win a playoff game and they're going to go to the wild card. It's like they haven't been good enough. Like this is the first year where they have the right pieces moving forward where they can build something special. And for the Niners, they've always been good. You know, they're just like Philadelphia. You know, they're, they're always going to be in the mix. So, because I mean, hell, if I was incredibly biased, I would say Tampa's winning against the Lions, which they still could. But if Mike Evans isn't playing, we're not winning that game. Or if we do, then Baker has to be amazing on third down, like 10 for 11. You know, everything has to go to Gucci. And we have to pick off, get a couple fumbles. You know, and I, I got a lot of the guys in fantasy on both teams too, so. I mean, if you just look at my fantasy team, you can tell who I believe in. So if I got guys on certain teams, that probably means that I've researched it pretty heavy. 
So if I got Amon Ra and David Montgomery, I probably got him for a reason. If I have CJ Stroud on my bench, probably means that, you know, the Texans have a shot to, you know, get to the playoffs, possibly, you know. Jacksonville division to lose. But if there was a second team, uh, you know, it's not going to be the Titans or the Colts. It's going to be the Texans. That's not a hot take. That's just reality. You know, it's eye test. It's watching games. Also, me doing reaction videos for a lot of the games so I can actually break down the film if I didn't watch the, the full game. And I feel like once you watch the highlight package or a reaction video or the game, you're going to have a lot more knowledge about what you're seeing compared to people that aren't doing that. I mean, the more, the more you read and the more film you watch, the more educated uh, your guesses are going to be and the more right you're going to be if you, I mean, if you know football. Patriots, Dallas, and then Dallas. Yeah, of course. But even even Dallas is a pretender. You know, they're a team that could end up winning, you know, eight, nine, ten games, but you know the same shit's gonna happen. Dak will throw some picks. The defense will do as good as they can for as long as they can, and then they'll lose. <laughs> Same thing happens every single year. McCarthy is not a good coach. Jones is not a good owner. Dak is overrated. They have good pieces, but they don't even give C.D. Lamb like a true number one receiver the ball enough. You know, they finally made the decision that Zeke needed to get out, but they're not using Tony Pollard correctly. Offensive line needs some help. Defense is nothing unless Micah's healthy. If Micah's healthy, they're good. But then obviously with the Diggs injury, that killed it. You know, you, you need to understand that you know, you can have a favorite team and you can like, you know, root for a team and root for players, but you got to be able to not be in denial when you start to see the weaknesses and the, you know, chinks in the armor start to come through and the you know cracks in the, in the wall, like, you know, losing digs and acting like it didn't make a big deal is fucking ridiculous. You know, especially if you're a cowboy fan, like brushing it off. Ah, we lost him. No big deal. Really big deal. You know, Micah being hurt, really big deal. Like, you know, you're not the same level as the Niners or the Eagles, but honestly, nobody is. Those are the two best teams in, in football, hands down. And even the Chiefs, the Dolphins, and Lions are not on that level. They're on the level below them. And I trust the uh, Niners, linebackers, and secondaries more. That's why I give the Niners the edge. <clears throat> yeah, but also Dallas um, got ahead of themselves because their wins came from the dog shit teams in the NFL, the Giants, the Jets, right, and the Patriots. So, I mean, if, you're, if your team is dog shit and you're beating up on dog shit teams, then you get this false sense of confidence where you think the team might be good, and then you find out after like week five, week six, week seven, oh shit, our three wins. We're against three of the top or three of the bottom seven teams in the NFL. Maybe we're not as good. <clears throat> but you don't realize that until you get to like week five, week six, week seven, week eight, because you got to see who they play and how they play against other teams. And then you start to realize, oh, these wins are fake. These, these are not wins against Tampa, Seattle, Detroit. You're, you're beating up on the Jets, Giants, and Pats. And that it does not look impressive. So no wonder you got fucking blasted by a team that might win the Super Bowl this year. That's the reality. You have to understand. You just can't be like, we damn boys. And then just think that all these things that you're seeing and then you're in denial. Oh, we're on the same level as the Niners. No, the fuck you're not. You know, and if you think you are, you're, you know, you're fucking mistaken. You'll learn. It's either, it's those people that, you know, it's either you, you understand football and depth and talent or you don't. You understand what you're looking at or you're just blind and you're just you know, rooting for the team. Go oh, Dallas, we damn boys. I'm just going to keep rooting for him every year, and eventually we're going to win the Super Bowl. I'm going to believe what Skip Bayless is saying. I'm going to believe what they say in the media, that they're just hating on us, right? And we're better. But the same shit happens every year, Dak jokes. But we have to get to a certain point now where we have to be like, I was always a Dak supporter, but over time, if you can never get better, right, and you continue to get worse or make mistakes or throw picks, how long are you going to get defended by people that aren't Cowboy fans? Time ran out. I supported him as I felt that he was, uh, you know, 
maybe a little underrated, but I thought he was a top 12 quarterback. Sometimes he played like a top eight. But again, being a regular season uh, superstar does not cut it when you fold in the playoffs every year. And you have to be able to be real with yourself and understand that he is not good. Like there, there's guys like Brock Purdy that are much, much better. And if Brock Purdy was on Dallas, he would have more wins. It's just hard to be able to, you know, maybe come to that realization to root for a guy like a Brock Purdy, which is a no-name guy, rather than a popular Dak Prescott. But it's not about popularity, you know, or being uh, like Jimmy Garoppolo and being handsome. Handsome doesn't get you Super Bowls. It gets you the ladies. There's a difference. All right, top of the seventh, still 4-0, two outs, runner at first and second. Can the Dodgers do anything? Yeah, and it hasn't ever been the same in, until you had all three. You needed to have Martin, Smith, and who? The third. Frederick, Travis. And then when you ended up having those three, that's when Zeke was his best in his rookie year, and he declined every year after that, but no one wanted to admit it. You know, only people that actually know the stats and the analytics and watch would be able to bring that up. Now, is Zeke still one of the, uh, you know, top 10 running backs and could get 1,000 yards? There we go. Finally, the Dodgers get a run. Yeah, I mean, he could get 10 touchdowns. He can get 1,000 to 1,200 yards. You know, but when you go from 16 games to 17 games, 1,000 yards is no longer the barometer of being a good running back. It's 1,100 and 1,200. And then if you get up to like the 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, you're fucking beast mode. But 1,000 yards don't mean shit anymore. It did back when I was a kid, but not now. Not the way that the game is being played. You know, but again, some people are stuck in the past. So, shit, even with Jimmy G, that's not solving the problems. <laughs> He's a game manager. He throws too many picks. All he would be, all he would make New England is just more handsome. He still would be playing just as bad. Honestly, I would rather have Zappy and, uh, you know, I, you know, probably if I was doing the pecking order, I would probably go, shit, Zappy and then Jimmy and then Mac. Zappi isn't good enough to be the starter, but I trust him more than the other two. So I don't, you know, that's if you look at my fantasy team, I mean, like I said, I, I'm always looking for opportunities. I look for top 10, you know, players at the position, you know, but if I got to take a, a chance on an Osborne after Jay Jetta got hurt, <laughs> you bet your ass I am. <laughs> Yeah. And the Cowboys need to realize it's not about running backs and wide receivers and tight ends. They need to start getting like Pro Bowl offensive linemen. Oh, well, another hit. There we go. Dodgers with another. 4-2. All right. At least the Dodgers have a little bit of life now. It makes the game somewhat exciting. Yeah, I got to take this pitcher out. I agree. The momentum has shifted. And you know what? Bill knows that Zappy is better, right? Bill knows. I know. A lot of people, think, a lot of fans know. Some people don't, aren't willing to admit it, or maybe they're thinking it, but they just need someone like me to say it out loud. Zappy is better. He's been better. He's more of a fan favorite. He doesn't throw picks. The players play harder for him when he's in the game. Body language, shoulders are up. They're not sulking and down like when Mac is in, right? But why would they keep Mac in? Because Bill Belichick is trying to tank, and he knows that if he plays Mac, Mac equals more turnovers. More turnovers equals more losses. You don't want to win games at this point with Zappi. You want to lose games. And so if you know the psychology of the NFL, then you understand that Zappi is the better, right? And everyone knows it. Mac thinks he's better. He's not. But the reason that he's staying in is not because he's better. It's because they're trying to tank, and they actually think that you're going to fuck up more, and that plays into their plans of getting a higher draft pick. But Mac is too delusional to realize he thinks it's loyalty from Belichick. No, no, no. They're doing it because they don't believe in you. And that's the sad thing that happens with starters in the NFL. They have this false sense of security, thinking that they are actually better. But if you continue to fuck up and you're still in the game, it's not because you're popular and they like you. You're actually not as good, but they're trying to tank. But they're not saying they're tanking. There's some sports psychology for you. 
and ask Judah if, if he thinks that that might be the case too, because I guarantee that might not be a popular take, you know, in Boston sports media. But if I said that on Boston radio, I agree, I bet you 90% or more would agree with me. And those, those are very critical motherfuckers there. There's going to be the people that like, like Alabama football. And they're like, Oh, Roe Todd, Mac Jones, Orion, you're an idiot. But then the others are like, damn, I think that is right because they do want a better quarterback like a Michael Penix Jr., Drake May type. Like Drake May is who Bill Belichick is drooling on. So if he can get Drake May, if you put Zappy in, he ain't getting them. But if you keep Mac Jones in and keep fucking up, maybe Drake May ends up being the quarterback and then boom, shakalaka, then you got a Tom Brady-ish kind of guy in, in Belichick's mind. You see how I'm planting the seed? You know, and if I said that on Boston radio, I feel that people would agree with me, not want to fight me, you know, because it makes sense. It makes sense. You know, but again, some people aren't smart enough to look, uh, you know, read between the lines. I try to look at it from a GM perspective, head coaching perspective. And if I was on the staff, how would I act? What would I think? What would I say to Bill, to be honest? Like, you know, I was like, listen, we're in the war room. You know, Mac is not better, Bill. What the fuck are we doing? We're losing on purpose. Ah, okay. I got it. All right, you know, it sucks because then the starting quarterback thinks they're better than they are, and then they have this like false sense of of confidence and security and swagger, you know. And then they and then if they're smart enough, they actually realize it after it's too late, after Mac Jones is no longer there and Drake May is the quarterback, and then they may be like, "Oh fuck, they kept me in because I was fucking up. It wasn't loyalty to me. They were just doing it because they knew I was gonna fuck up." And that's a part of sports too. That's how that's a part of coaching. Finally got out of the inning. There we go. LG. Dak is not the guy, I will agree. He's got the locker room. That's fine. But again, you, you can have the locker room. You can have the Dallas Cowboy fans. But if you're starting to notice, diehard Cowboy fans are finally getting to the point where they're getting fed up with him. And it took five, six, seven years of the same shit instead of like normally like three years. And you're like, this ain't working, you know, divorce. But then with the Cowboy fans, it's like loyal, 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 loyal. But at some point, you have to realize offensive line needs to be better. You know, the defense of Dan Quinn and Micah are good, right? But what is the consistent problem? Quarterback, turnovers, head coach, play calling, the owner. If you don't mix up those things, the formula is going to stay the same every single year. And uh, Trey is not that. 100% Trey is not that. Because if Kyle Shanahan thought that Trey was going to pan out, it would have been him and Purdy together. 100%. Kyle Shanahan isn't going to throw away a piece if he thinks the piece is going to pan out. What Trey is is damaged goods. He's injury prone like Greg Oden, and he'll always be that way. He will not be the Cowboy quarterback. 100%. But again, some people like maybe yourself and other Cowboy fans may think, oh, this could be it. But also, too, Starbox, Aikmans, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these guys, you know, Danny Whites, you know, uh, these guys don't grow on trees. You know, and honestly, you guys would be in a better position today with Tony Romo than you would be with Dak. Everyone wanted to talk shit about Romo. Then he found out uh, that he was good at broadcasting. Then all you guys found out, I found out that he was great at broadcasting. And then you look at his style of play. And then imagine if Romo was the quarterback now, you guys would have more wins than you had with Dak, but everyone just loved to hate on Romo because he was on the Cowboys. But now he's in broadcasting. We start to realize after he was retired that if he played today, you get more wins on the Cowboys than you do with Dak, 100%, because he's not going to turn the football over as much, and he is just as good in the bootleg as Dak, sometimes even better. And that's not a hot take. That's just real. You know, but a lot of times people are thinking things, but they need someone like me to say it out loud. And they're like, you know what? That might be true. Some people will disagree. Meow, Dak, 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 Dak. What the fuck has Dak done? Has he got to the NFC Championship game? Have they got to the Super Bowl? Can you rely on him late in the game? And the answer is no, no, and no. You know, he's a popular name. Anybody that goes to the Cowboys will be loved or hated. Romo, Romo, homo, hated, right? Unfairly. Got gets into broadcasting. Now we love him. Right. And then you start to appreciate his career when he was there, when he was getting hated on. And then you see all the problems with Dak and you're like, oh, God damn, if Romo was there, they still wouldn't be Super Bowl caliber, but they actually could go to the playoffs and maybe win a game. You see that? Not go to the Super Bowl, but actually not choke you know, at the end of the season in November and December and maybe every other year win a game. Is that crazy talk? No. 
it's real. You know, but if I was being like, oh, yeah, they're going to go to Super Bowls with Romo, then that's a hot take because that's not true. You know, maybe an NFC championship game if they built the O-line, fired McCarthy and got rid of Jerry Jones, but we know those things aren't happening. But if those were to happen, Jerry still controls the team, but then you get a Jimmy Johnson type of personality, you beef up the O-line, and you get a better quarterback than Dak, then yeah, then you'll be able to get there. But until those big things change, Dallas will repeat itself in a dangerous, vicious, depressing cycle for not only Cowboy fans to endure, but all of us. And then everyone knows that it's going to be the we damn boys. And at the end of the year, uh, you know, they're burning the jersey. Or they're using it as a mop because that's what the DAC uh, people are doing now. They're on the internet. Now they're breaking uh, autograph photos, throwing them in the trash, ripping them up. They're putting uh, the jersey on the end of a mop and they're uh, picking up dog shit with it, you know? So it, it seems like uh, fans are, are, are like surprised. Like the writing has been on the wall that Dak has been, uh, you know, a great regular season quarterback, but a terrible playoff quarterback and a terrible quarterback when it gets late in the season. But he's Dak Prescott, so we give him the benefit of the doubt because he's popular and he's on the Cowboys. But, I mean, how many years of uh, below average play in the crucial moments that define your career are we going to keep giving him a free pass? First year, fine. Second year, fine. Third year, fine. After that, you know, no more passes, right? But do, do, you, do you see, like, the, 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 the football knowledge that I'm giving to you guys, like, this is, like, you know, takes that aren't takes, but they just need to be able to get out there. Like, I feel like if I could get my takes with more global exposure, you know, I could connect to uh, way more people than these guys that are on TV. Because I know that you guys are like, you know, when I say these certain things, you're like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Like the whole Mac Jones thing, Zappy being better, but him not getting in and starting because they actually are trying to lose now and get Drake May, right? So maybe you didn't think of it, you know, like initially, but like when someone brings up something that could actually be a plausible, uh, you know, thing, you know, then it's like the wheels start turning and you're like, holy shit. Yeah, maybe that is true. And then it's not like rumor. You know, I just think that's what I see. You know, some people see the game differently than others. You know. Who's better, Brady, Flacco or Dan or Oh, definitely Dan Orlovsky. Dan is the best. So you're a Patriot fan, though, right? So you don't like Romo, right? And and then you like Aikman, right? But you're an AFC fan. NFC fans, we're different. We think Aikman sucks, and Joe Buck is a baseball announcer, and Romo and Jim Nance are actually the best duo in the NFL. You might have a personal thing against Romo, but he has ESP. They got good voices, and they have good chemistry. So most people on the West Coast or NFC fans, we see it that way. So you guys see it one way for your AFC broadcasters. We see it. We have appreciation. AFC people hate on uh, Nance and Romo. NFC appreciate. And then also for me, you know, Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt, they are the best duo in sports. You know, and I emulate my style over Gus. And then the best in the NFL is Jim Nance and Tony Romo. Now, I might be a guy on the West Coast, but I guarantee there's people in the room that agree with me. They might not necessarily agree. Uh, with everyone and how they view the AFC, but see that's like something right there where you don't you don't care for him, but we don't care <laughs> really for Aikman. Aikman, it seems like he's always he's always you know is like oh uh, you know he's always eyes red. I don't know. It's not as bad as like uh, Chris Collinsworth. You know that's like the most terrible thing in sports. Um, you know just like Stephen A. and and Skip Bayless, you know, there's a lot of guys that are like personalities, but they really don't have any substance or intelligence or good takes. Like, like there's some guys in sports media where it's just being a personality or like someone on YouTube. And there's other people that actually genuinely have fucking talent like us here, you know. There's other people that entertain and that could be popular, but that doesn't mean they're smarter than us or that they know more than us, you know. And I, I want to be able to learn. You know, I want to be able to win money. I want to be able to do good at fantasy. I want to be able to create bonds with every fan base. I want to be able to have educated football talk. I don't want to be talking to a bunch of fucking idiots, you know. It's like you can already tell, like, when you go to a party or you go to a bar or you go to your friend group, you always got that one motherfucker that fucking acts like they know football or whatever we're talking about, and they're just fronting, you know. And it's like, if you, first 30 seconds, you can tell initially, do they know what they're talking about or are they a bullshitter? It only takes that long, so...
So what what makes you, uh, as a Patriot fan in the AFC, and I guarantee it's not just you, AFC fans think like this as well, um, but why do you not like his tonality? Is it just because you don't like the Cowboys and Romo? What, where is the Romo hate coming from? Is it, is it you know, based on, on what compared to you have a certain style that you prefer? So there's nothing wrong with preferring Aikman over Romo. But that's like, you, like if we were going to do a poll of America, right? 90% I feel would go with Romo and Nance. And then the 10%, you know, which you're a part of, <laughs> maybe as AFC fans, you know, don't like uh, Nance and, and, and Romo. Some do, you know, but, uh, you know, so maybe maybe it's just a type of style. Like, I, I like Madden and Summerall. I like a lot of the grandpas, you know, Harry Terry, you know, Dave Niehaus, um, you know, Vin Scully. My, my favorite doing college football was Keith Jackson, you know, not the tight end, you know, back in the day, you know, for the Eagles, but the uh, old school Caucasian grandpa. You know, I loved his Pac-8, Pac-10. Back 12 voice. It was so special. Like, there are just certain grandpa voices that are just so money for sports. And if you have a young person voice, you have to have good tonality. You know, you have to have good reflection in your voice. You have to have good aura and vibe. Uh, and thank God and the, the sports gods and obviously my mom and dad that I don't have a cringy, you know, sports voice. But if I wasn't doing this, you know, it would be some type of, you know, therapist or boys and girls club or teacher or mentor or psychologist you like aikman because it reminds you of your youth yeah troy aikman baby i mean of course but even if you like someone uh, from the youth doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be good on the mic like take for example steve young love him but on the microphone nah, not for me and i love the niners growing up you know joe montana and jerry rice and steve young but there's just certain guys you know, that are a little bit better than others. You know, I guess it just depends on what you like as a style, you know. See, you like all the ones that you're like an AFC fan. Not all of them are the same, but you like the people that the NFC people don't like. Like a lot of us, we don't like Collinsworth and we don't like Aikman uh, and, and, and Joe Buck. And you're, the, you're those are the ones that you love on that side. And then us on like the West Coast and on the NFC fans primarily, we appreciate what we have on the opposite side, we wish we had Romo and Nance calling NFC games. We're mad that we have Aikman. Uh, so maybe we should do a swap because apparently you guys don't like what you have. We don't like what we have. And apparently the opposite side likes the other piece. So maybe we should flip. Maybe Aikman and, and you know, and Joe Buck should do AFC and we get Nance and Romo. Yes, please. You know? Oh, you don't like you don't like Collinsworth. Voice is bad, but you know what's even worse than voice is bad. He created something special in PFF. He started that with his boys, right? But you never have anything knowledgeable or factual or anything memorable ever. Like think about anything that you've ever learned from Chris Collinsworth in any broadcast that you've ever seen in your entire life. Name one thing you remember, and that's when you know someone isn't good. That's when you know that it, you're not learning from the person, you know, and then on top of that, if they don't have a good voice, then you're totally fucked. Then you're like, ears are bleeding and your nose is bleeding and then you're having to suffer. Or you put it on mute and you come here and then you listen to me call the game or some other awesome YouTuber and then it's like, oh, okay, cool. I, you know, I'll watch the game and I'll turn the volume low so I can still hear the game going on, but then I would rather vibe and listen to someone else. And that's why YouTube is so awesome. You know, Twitch has got the video game thing, but I feel like the connections you can build here rather than someone playing a video game, they can't read the comments necessarily right away when the video game is going and they're playing it, you know. But when you're grinding, you know, you have a time to actually get to know people and whatnot. So, see, I got all the takes. Like even these like five things that I bring up right now in this show, these would be headline things on Pat McAfee's show or Good Morning Football that would be excellent topics to talk about, you know. Instead of the same bullshit over and over and over again, you know, Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, you know, let's, let's go deeper on why things are looking the way that they are, you know? Yeah, he's a quarterback, though. He processes information very quickly like me, you know? I'm not a quarterback, but I feel the people that have ESP and they can predict stuff, he's able to do it because he's very self-aware. He's a quarterback, and when you're a quarterback, you know where every position is lined up and what the route is. So if you see personnel and you're very intelligent as a quarterback 
or a defensive linebacker, you're going to be some of the smartest people on the football field because you know your position, but everyone on the defense and offense as well. That's why you don't get a lot of fucking idiots that play those positions unless you're, you know, Jamarcus Russell and you're not watching tape and it's blank and you said you watched the game film and they made it blank on purpose because they know that you weren't watching film. You know, you're always going to get, you know, the dummies, you know, and then you're going to get the bus like the Ryan Leaf, you know, but you can root for them to do good after football, you know, or uh, Jake the Snake Plumber. I don't know if you guys watch the Good Morning Football, but he's doing this like mushroom thing, doing the handball. Dude, that guy's cool. Like, I, I like where Jake Plummer is going, you know, and uh, again, a lot of guys that will have mental health problems after football, and you just got to be able to find that passion after football. And some of these guys uh, have, you know, gotten sober or kind of, uh, you know, had a second coming of life after their football career. I can only watch Good Morning Football and Pat McAfee. I can't watch anything else. Like, you literally couldn't pay me. Uh, you know, I feel you can get more uh, information and knowledge here, you know. And I think that's why some of the channels, they actually creep on Twitter and they creep on the YouTube page because they need material. Because they know out of all the sports channels that are out there, we can hit you with more hot takes and topics and things to talk about and have an educated view of sports rather than any other channel. That's why people fucking uh, copy and steal my shit, you know? And they fucking know you guys, you know? They know. You know one thing the Dodgers know? They're going to lose this game. But they made a nice rally. Top of the eight, four, two, Diamondbacks. Runner at first. Big swing in the mask. Got him. Freddie, sit down. You think, Ro you think Romo has brain damage? No, uh, he don't got brain damage, bro. He's actually super intelligent. See, it's, you're just, you have to see it from a different point of view. Because, I mean, the point of view for the AFC fans, I don't know. I think it's only like 10% of the country. Some people, I think they just don't, uh, you, you have a different type of style. People talk different in different regions. You know, you're going to have different races, different age, different vibe, and everyone is going to be different. Some people like an older voice. Some people like a female voice. Some people, uh, you know, have an attraction to different styles and vibes and auras and whatnot. You know, but I think Romo is fast paced, he's very knowledgeable, and I don't think he's got brain damage. I actually think he's one of the best in the business. Like if I was gonna end up being in a booth, I would want to be in the middle or on the outside with Nance calling the play by play, and then you obviously got Romo doing color, right? And then obviously my number one would be Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt, or Gus Johnson and Charles Davis. I mean, there's just certain people that know football, that have a good voice, and you actually learn shit. You know, it's not just a broadcast. There we go. One more inning left. Let's go. Let's go to the bottom of the eighth. Yeah, and I had to, like, boycott, you know, Good Morning Football for, like, a while because of Peter Schrager coming to the channel and stealing my stuff and claiming it that it's his. And a lot of those people on TV, you know, even if you're not famous, like, it's not like I have 200,000 subs or 2 million. You know what I mean? I'm like on the lower end of on the bubble of blowing up. Like I haven't completely blown up yet. Like I got to a nice establishment point, you know, top 2% out of 140 million channels is what, it, you know, if you have 10,000 subs or more, it's only 2% out of 140 million channels. So we're there, we're at 20, but I feel that we're very undervalued and we're definitely uh, the channel that gets creeped on and spied on the most but we will catch up to the support with some of the others. And it's just going to, you know, we have to wait our turn. So. I like Romo, but again, everyone seemed to have this like view of Romo when he was playing, Oh, stupid, you know, whatever. But then you start to like appreciate people and how they see the game. And you know, everyone has a different style. And I'm not saying Judah, like if you like Troy Aikman and Joe Buck, I, don't know, I hope we can do a trade one day and you guys can get them. I will swap. And I think both fan bases on the AFC and NFT would be happy because maybe it's just that cadence and that style, you know, but I like energy. <clears throat> I like fast paced. I like ESP. I, I like a uh, good tonality. And uh, Jim Nance is the best by a billion on the NFL. And I think other people would agree. And I think that, you know, even if you don't watch college football, if you get a chance to listen to Gus, you know, it's like, I always like those broadcasts with like Vern Lundquist on like CBS also but it's nothing compared to Gus. I mean, Gus would make me watch like goddamn Indiana and Michigan State. I got no business watching that goddamn game, but if he's calling it, you know, in the morning, like at 9 a.m., like it, it gets you going. Like 
He is a, a very talented. Gus is so good. He could do anything. Basketball, baseball, football, hockey. It's just about, you know, if people understand how good he is. Like, it's just kind of mind-boggling to me that he doesn't do NBA. Like, he would make the NBA amazing if he did it. You know, he does college hoops and does college NFL, but he is he is the best, you know, as far as energy and passion. And then, you know, on that level. And I think he would be right there with Jim Nance, like, as being the two best in the world. Yeah. I mean, unless your boy gets an opportunity. They got to get me in the fucking booth. What they need to do is get all the best YouTubers, right? Then you have sports YouTube, and that's just the best, you know, 10. And then, uh, you know, you have like ESPN to Ocho, you know, and then that's how, you, I mean, if you already got Sunday ticket on YouTube, people are going to YouTube. You might as well get the best people that cover the NFL together and make like a squad, you know? That's going to probably uh, get more views than anything besides Good Morning Football and Pat McAfee show. It'll, it'll get more views than any of the others. Evan Phillips, bottom of the eighth, four to Diamondbacks. He had this perception of Romo. You're like, this guy is brain damaged. He's dumb. I don't like the way he talks, right? That predicted son of a bitch, right? And then you're like, oh, well, these guys kind of like it. You just got, it's like different perspectives, you know? But everyone's going to have a, a different type of style. I also like people that are genuine and real. I don't like people that are fake and fugazi, you know? People that front, people that lie, you know? It, I, I, you know, real recognizes real. And it's like, even if you don't meet someone face to face, you can kind of get an idea if you know how to read people, you know, like, like, a, like to break down a player, like, you know, player analysis is one of my favorite things to do, you know, like, like watching film and like scouting and, uh, you know, breaking down like talent. Like that's one of my favorite things to do uh, in life. You know, because you want to be able to know who the greats are before they get great on that, that uh, professional level. Yeah, but I don't think, I think it's the opposite. I don't think he sounds like he's had brain damage or anything. I think he sounds that like he's just a very high energy guy, you know, played quarterback, super intelligent. He got ESP, he knows how routes are run. And that's why he's able to predict a lot of things because he's super intelligent. You know, but again, I don't put the hate on the Cowboys or Tony Romo. I just look at it as a person-to-person -person evaluation regarding of whatever team or whatever, uh, you know, fan base. Like, I, I don't look at that. I just look at each individual equally, regardless of race or age or whatever. And then I just be like, okay, do I like this or, or do I not like it? And then I give my opinion. Well, hopefully we can trade with y'all. Throw it a first and save. Here we go. Yeah. Well, just because you have concussions, it's not like, you know, people are stuttering and, and or, you know, or they have like, you know, getting to the point where they're like really in trouble. Like when we see people that have like Parkinson's and like, you know, people that are uh, Michael J. Fox and you start to, you know, you see like people that are really like, you know, football players normally, regardless of the CTE, you know, it's like you're not necessarily getting that type of reaction. What you're getting is mental health. And then they end up, hurting themselves or doing something bad, you know, because they don't have anything to go to after football. They, they have a routine. The routine is gone. They get depressed. You know, it's like getting fired from a job. And then all of a sudden you have no direction, no goals. And that's why the mental health thing is uh, really big in sports, you know, and you don't have to play on the professional level to understand that, that these are real people. Yeah. They maybe are heroes like wrestlers and whatnot, but at the end of the day, they're people and they go through it too. You just have to know people. Sweeper to Guriel. Diamondbacks four, Dodgers two, bottom of the eighth. Yeah. That's what's good about this channel, though, too, you know, because like I said, we can throw out, you know, different things. You know, everyone's opinion is valued. Everyone's opinion matters, you know. I just try to be able to give people a different perspective that the average person thinks or, you know, what's going on. 
You know, it's like if I can give you that alternative like way of thinking where you can still have your opinion, you can think your way is correct or this is correct or whatever, but just that other, you know, thing that maybe you didn't really realize or think of and then, you know, and then you can evaluate and think of different options or situations, you know. The sports definitely isn't one-sided. All right, Matt. Popped up. Yeah, and that's okay. I'm not saying that you're weird or you're wrong or anything like that. It's just that we haven't heard that take uh, besides like AFC fans. like I, And a lot of AFC fans still like Nance and Romo, but that's why I think it's cool. You know, it's like it needs to be pointed out because like here, we don't really hear that. We hear the opposite where we're like, eh, Aikman and Buck are all right. You know, they're okay. But we prefer as NFC fans, Romo and Nance. So it's just cool to get a different perspective. Two away. Yeah. You know, like I said, I, I can't just be a, a person that just agrees with every single person just to get likes or subs or donos. You know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, if I feel something and that's how it is, I have to keep it 100 all the time. I can't just cater to the, the fan bases that support me the most. I can't tell them what they want to hear. I got to tell them the truth, you know, and that might be, you know, everyone's got a different opinion, but I got to give my truth. And even if it's not their truth, then maybe I can, uh, you know, I can make someone second guess maybe their original opinion, you know, and sometimes I'll be wrong. Sometimes I'll have a different opinion. Someone's left. I'm right. You know, when someone's right. I'm left. But. But I feel like I can connect with a stronger amount of a fan base across the board. Like, you know, I'm going to have certain fan bases disagree with me. But as a whole, if I said my statement and I did it in front of every fan base, all 32, there may be one or two fan bases that disagree very very strongly, but then a majority would uh, give my, you know, I think my take would be, like, oh, that, that's valid. You know, not everyone will agree, but they're like, oh, I, I see what he's saying, you know. Max, bro. But, you know, everyone will get defensive, you know, when you say something about the player or the team because people love their teams and players so much, you know. It's like it's not meant to be a personal attack or an insult that people take it that way sometimes. You know, I think everyone has at some point or another. I guess it just depends on who it's coming from. But if it's not coming from like a negative standpoint, like where I'm not doing it, talking shit like other people would. then if I'm saying something, I'm saying it from the heart, you know, like I'm just trying to this is it, you know. But I think even when I'm being this is it, people are like, oh, this is an attack. You're attacking my favorite team and my player. And, and I disagree with you, you know, like. Yeah. Like one day, you know, once the algorithm and, and, and you know, just proper, we wait our turn, you know, it's going to be like, who knows how many people will be in the room? Who knows what the sub count's going to be? You know, who knows what, what record breaking days we're going to have? You know, it's like, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, just being diligent, man. We need some goats. Support. But I am proud that we got to the uh, the 20K. You know, that's a big, big thing. Oh, of course they do. Yep. You know, maybe, you know what, one theory I have is that why well, you guys don't like Romo and Nance because you guys get them every week, like all the time. So you're burnt out. You know, and us, we don't get enough. So, and you guys don't get enough of Aikman and uh, Joe Buck. And that's maybe why you guys like them because you don't see them as often unless you tune into an NFC game. So maybe that's a theory to that uh, way of thinking. 
and we both don't get the other one as much unless we go out of our way to watch a game in the other conference. Because most people are AFC fans. They like AFC ball and AFC teams. NFC fans tend to like NFC people and NFC teams. We still appreciate the other conference like the AFC fans do. But normally we're not going out of our way to be like, oh my God, I got to watch this AFC team play. Like, not really. You know, it's like we already got plenty of cool shit in our divisions in the NFC where we're, we're good. We're Gucci. You know, but if it's a good matchup, Bills, Chiefs, oh yeah, we'll, we'll tune in. You know, but I think that's maybe, maybe, uh, you know, another way of uh, thinking that maybe we never thought about before. See? And see, that's another take, you know, on Good Morning Football or Pat McAfee show. It's like when you have these different opinions that come out, why do we have the opinion like that? Then you got to dig deeper. Is it just personal choice or is it just what we have and we've seen it so often so we're burnt out? But either you recognize that or you don't. And that's the difference between this channel and the others, you know. We go deeper. You know, everyone else is black, white, we're gray, and we're, we're digging deeper. Not the obvious, you know, beyond the obvious. Stats, analytics, all that. I mean, I, I mean, if I was going to be in somewhere, I wouldn't want to go to a channel where it's pranks all the time or it's like funny videos. I need to learn something, you know. Like, I mean, if people want to spend five hours a day, you know, watching YouTube or TikTok or whatever, and it's like prank videos and funny videos, I mean, that's fine. But golly, I mean, you, you could be very productive in your life if you take that five hours away and apply yourself, you know. I get it. Some people love that shit, but like it's like out of control. Aikman. Yeah. Always the Cowboys on Thanksgiving. That means that you had really good memories uh, with the Thanksgiving, uh, you know, during that time period. You know, it's my favorite holiday, you know, family, food, friends, football. And I usually try to get back here for the late game. So that way I can actually stream on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, trying to spend time with family, but you guys are like the secondary family with the people that we have. Uh, you know, some of the mods and some of the people are pretty close. You know, some closer than others. But, you know, it's always fun to be able to, you know, vibe with each other at the end of the day after we've already had our family and food and friend time where it's like, okay, we can go to like you know, the evening YouTube time and, and we can all just vibe and uh, talk about what we got and who we saw, how much uh, food we ate and, and we're in a food coma and, you know, just good vibes. And then we can match that energy by uh, hanging out and watching football together. I mean, what the hell is better than that? Nothing. Nothing. Especially with that Thanksgiving uh, second and third meal, the leftovers, you know, the turkey sandwiches and just the good good and the pie. Pie hits really good, that, that, that second meal after you get home. Leftovers, that first plate in the, in the microwave or if you make a sandwich. Mashed potatoes, gravy. Turkey, bang, bang, is right there. ESP, time traveler, knowledge. Top of the ninth, four, two, Diamondbacks, Mad Max Muncie in the box. We will give proper love. Come on, Seawald. There we go. Mariner fans are rooting. Aikman, yeah. I mean, like I said, I was born in 82. So, I mean, I got plenty of Aikman, Urban, and uh, Emmett Smith, Dion memories. I mean, it's very, very special to me. And you know what it is? It's like if you actually know, you know, because I, I feel like I read people really well and I know, like, how personalities are. But the most crucial time where you'll think everything is cool is going to be from when you were seven years old until you're like 12. And anything in that time range, if you go back in your life and look at toys, cartoons, you know, sports cards, whatever, memories playing on sports teams. But the coolest shit, you know, if you go back into your life, seven to 12 years old, and that's why we try to reconnect with our younger selves, because we remember those really good memories that we had at that age. It could be as young as five or six. But typically, it's like 7 to 12, but it could extend from 12 to 18. And then you have good memories and bad memories. But that's what we associate and have those good vibes, you know. So Dr. O coming out. Base hit. 
Yeah. I mean, I saw, I mean, I, I, when Aikman got drafted, I was, I was like, uh, that was the year I met King Griffey Jr. So I was like, well, I was seven. But I had a very good understanding of sports when I was seven. When I was seven, I think I understood sports on like a, maybe like a 10 year old level. You know, I wasn't like on a 15 or like a Sheldon, you know, Big Bang Theory, like, or, you know, like super advanced MIT shit or whatever. But I felt like, you know, the way with my dad in like sports cards and collecting and reading the backs of all the sports cards growing up and memorizing the stats. I mean, that definitely, you know, made me who I am today. I still played the Nintendo and the Sega, played sports outside, but a lot of, a lot of, of the reading with the cards and whatnot. A lot of, a lot of games watched. Big swing and a miss. Yes, reflect in the building. What's good? Let's go, Seawald. Come on, Paul. Should have never got rid of them, but again, we needed to get a couple positional players. So, but it's only fitting that he's there to have a chance to be able to actually do something worthwhile. You know, the Mariners didn't see uh, that, that, that value, and sometimes that's what ends up happening. You know what I'm saying? Like someone, uh, you know, throws out the trash or thinks that they can, you know, move on, and then you fail to realize, like, how good that piece really is. It's that missing piece they needed. Same thing with Tommy Pham and Evan Longoria. Those three pieces is why we're here today. Hello. You look better in a Mariner uniform, but I still like you. Dope, 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 dope. Seawald, Seawald. You're my boy. You're my boy. Best player in the first 60 games with Kalanick. Seawald, reliable dog. And if you're reliable, I like you. If you're not reliable, and here's Kike Hernandez. Last hope. Oh, dog got the foul ball. That changed my life. It's like once you actually go to a baseball game and you get a ball, it's like you turn into like Zach Campbell, but not the asshole version. Seawald. I get a Seawald and a Kike. I mean, what's better than this? And I think it's very cool that he came back to the, the Dodgers. Like even though it's not going to lead to a championship or anything like that, it's just I think it's better for him to be in Dodger blue. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, aging players, it's a business and they need to be able to find their second coming or their third win. You know, it's like you'll have initial success, but the greats, they'll continue to have success after the initial first run of success. They'll be able to find it somewhere else, just being like a role player, but on the right team at the right time in the right year. See, well, did he go? Got him. He's kind of good. Five doll hairs, 95 to go. Grab the brooms. I mean, like I said, if you would have said that this was going to happen, people would have not be believed it. You know, but again, after, you know, watching a game or two, you can tell. Here it is. Hell yeah. Let's go D-backs. They're doing what Seattle wants to do, and we at least get one player in Seawald that gets to get a little bit of joy. Corbin Carroll is more clutch than Julio Rodriguez. So, you know, we, we can live kind of vicariously through them, and maybe this will be the first year, you know, of trying to do it almost every year like the Mariners. You know, it kind of feels like they are the Seattle Mariners of the National League, but they've advanced further than us, and good for them. Good for them. I love Corbin Carroll. I love me some Seawald. And my dad's team, you know, is Dodgers. It's been for 50, since 1950s. I've always rooted for them. This is the first time I've rooted against them because I didn't see a championship product. So why am I going to root and predict for a championship product if it's not championship product? Something else is better. Marte, Seawald. I mean, this is, feels good, man. And Corbin Carroll being from you know, Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. Like, we have reason to be able to root for this team. And like I said, it's like rooting for the Mariners because we're always going to be considered underdogs. 
So it's like, what, what a better underdog than the Diamondbacks. They're hot. They're playing. They believe. And that's the thing that they have over the Mariners. They believe. Like, you got guys that believe. I think, like, with the Mariners, you know, at so- certain points, you didn't have everyone believing. I mean, after Cal Raleigh hit the home run, everyone was believing. You know, but, like, this year, they didn't believe. And uh, they dropped way too many games and played way too many mediocre ball games. Did not get to five runs and seven hits uh, very often. We're terrible at one-run one run games. And um, pitching was suspect, and we didn't have good run support. And you got to hit better than 220 or 230 as a team if you want to make the playoffs consistently. I'm not telling any lies. This is cool. Yeah, I would say that the Braves are the bandwagon team, the popular team, but the team that's played better ball is Philadelphia. So if you're doing it with no bias, Philadelphia. If you're doing it with bias, Atlanta. You know, just based on how they did at the beginning of the year, how they did all year. But again, what is the difference? One team had a big break, the other team didn't. So that is the difference. You know, one team having Uncle Mo and that momentum and riding that momentum wave, and one team that had the momentum, then they had a week off, momentum gone. Right, momentum gone, cold, and then you just have to like turn it up, you know, immediately. And they weren't able to, and that's why Philadelphia uh, is going to end up winning again, in my opinion. Now, if the Braves come back, good for them. But just based off what I've seen in sports in the past, it feels ninety percent Philadelphia at this point. And then uh, Astros and Rangers, fifty-fifty. Rangers probably came in a little hotter, but Astros are holding their own. And Phillies are hotter, but Diamondbacks are holding their own. So, I mean, the most crazy thing is if the Diamondbacks actually made it and won it all. That would be the most shocking thing in sports. But hot and healthy. Playoff Mookie, playoff Freddy was bad this year. But again, the pitching, too. Like, if you're in an elimination game and you have fucking Lance Lynn, Let's just take a minute and think about that for a second. Dustin May, Big Red, Clayton Kershaw, uh, you know, Walter Walker Bueller, uh, Urias, Julio. You know, it's like you've got a lot of these other guys and other guys that they had, you know, sprinkled in Anderson. And, you know, you had all these other guys sprinkled, right? But if you don't got starter quality and then, you know, mid relievers, closers, and you're already down two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine runs. What, what do you expect the mid-reliever to do after Kershaw got pulled? You're fucked. Mentally, the series was over after that first inning. Dunzo. Road team comes in in your house and plucks you with a nine with your best pitcher in the first inning or first couple innings. Done. Series over. Yeah. But again, usually Cinderella's story runs out. And if I had to predict, I would say Phillies in six over the Diamondbacks. And then as far as Rangers and Astros, uh, that one could go seven. That one could go either way. Who the fuck knows? I could see the Rangers winning if they get the first two wins. Uh, If the Astros get the first two, then it's Astros easily. But the only way the Rangers can win is if they win the first two games. Put the pressure on. And if they do, they have a shot. Now, if they get down a game or two, uh, I think it'll be Astros. Because once the Astros smell blood, it's over, you know. But I think the Rangers and Astros is a little bit like fairly matched. The Diamondbacks are good, but even with their best, is it better than Philadelphia's best? I don't think so. But again, sports has a way to repeat itself, and sometimes it's uh, meant to be broken, and we get things that we've never seen before, like maybe the Diamondbacks in the World Series uh, with this team, with Corbin Carroll. Later, later, yeah. And then as much as people hate the Astros, we can't hate on Altuve and his greatness. Jordan has been on fire. You know, they got Verlander back. So it's like even though the Rangers are, are getting hot at the right time, who's got the best experience out of everyone left, the Phillies and the Astros? So it's like as much as we hate the Astros, this and that, it's like they got Dusty Baker. They, I mean, like, they don't really have weaknesses. So it's like you almost would assume that the Astros should be favored slightly, like 55-45. But – you know, if the Rangers win, would anyone really be shocked? No. Besides Astros fans, of course.
I had a feeling this was going to happen. But at least the Dodgers put up two. It wasn't like 4-0. But body language and, you know, and especially if you go into someone else's house and win the first two games there when you're not supposed to, then you, the series is over typically, you know, because, I mean, that is like you're mentally already out of it. You know, and you got to think how many Dodgers truly believe that they were going to come back and win like three straight. It was not going to happen. So once you have half of the team or more than half not believing, then chances are that third game you're done, you know, because they're going to give you their elimination ball and you're just hanging around waiting for dinner. Ernie Johnson, the TNT broadcast. I, I am actually looking forward to doing some basketball this year, you know, but again, the Blazers, I'll do them. I'll do the good matchup for like Celtics and Warriors and Bucks and Sixers and Heat. Um, you know, Lakers, you know, we'll, we'll do some stuff, but uh, definitely want to see Damon Giannis, though. That'll be fun. Pedro's like, oh, the Dodgers are going to come back. I'm like, come on, bro. But some people see the game differently. Some people are biased and they're just going to hang on to the Dodgers because they're the Dodgers. And people that aren't biased are just going to be like, you know what? They haven't looked good. This team has been unproven, but they are the better team. Yes, it's weird, but they are the better team. Boom. And then you pick them and people are like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, is it really that shocking now after to go back and look at the stats and analytics in the last three games? They beat the shit out of them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they're not famous. They're not a, a historic franchise, even though they got the Randy Johnson, uh, you know, Kirk Schilling dub, you know. But it's like, you know, Corbin Carroll is the truth. Like, superstar. Like, I don't have any rookie cards of Corbin Carroll autos. I should get one. You know, like, that's how good he is, where I would actually invest in a PSA 9 or a, B a BGS 9 or 9.5 of a Corbin Carroll auto, you know, serial numbered or whatever, you know, drop, drop a bill or two, you know, and grab something nice. Or Clutch and Julio, and from the Pacific Northwest. Come on, man. It's like Adley Rutschman on the Orioles. We can root for him. He went to Oregon State, you know, so Pacific Northwest people will root for Pacific Northwest people. And then when we get someone like this, we can be proud of, like with Julio. It's very cool. What a great day to be a Diamondback fan. Like, you got a Julio Rodriguez. You're like, you got a, a Hall of Fame player. You know, it's like, you got it. It's like, you have to go sometimes years and years and years and years. But sometimes you can tell by just one year or two years, this guy, if he doesn't get hurt, he will be Hall of Fame. And there he is. They're like, oh, they're talking about me. Oh, dog. What's up, bro? And that's when, uh, you know, you start to see the Mike Trouts, you know, emerge in front of your very eyes. And then you kind of wonder, when does that happen? Like, all of a sudden, you watch a guy, and then you already know that he's like LeBron James. And uh, you're looking at it right now. And it's a good time, because if it's not going to be the Braves and the Dodgers every year and the Phillies and Diamondbacks and maybe another team gets in the fold, then we'll actually have like five teams that might be able to win it all. And that'll make uh, National League Baseball more exciting instead of it just being like one team or two teams every year. What's up, Joe? I was keeping it real, bro. You know what I mean? Like even with my dad, you know, Dodgers, the, the, the pitching, you know, the injuries, not having your Hall of Fame players step up. And like sometimes you just you get to a point where you were a championship caliber team for three years, the best team in baseball. You knew they were going to win one to three World Series. And then you have these injuries. And when you have a fucking Lance Lynn in an elimination game on the road, you're already packing your bags before the first pitch came out because you lost the first two at home. And there's nothing you know wrong to lose to uh, an emerging superstar and, and that caliber of players. But uh, every good comes to an end and has to rebuild. And, uh, you know, they'll learn to rebuild. How are you, bro? Living the dream. You know, I'm living the dream, bro. Just grinding. You know, I did, you know, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, wrestling, grinding every day. I've dropped 60 pounds. You know, quit a lot of the booze and everything. And, uh, you know, change the diet. You know, no fast food, uh, no soda. You know, so I'm, I'm trying to better myself, you know. And obviously, to be able to do that, you got to be able to make time to, grind but i gotta have the meantime but i hope things are going good with you and your son uh your job i missed you and then uh maybe one of these days you know dodger baseball or something we can you can come over and we, and we can uh do a game 
together and whatnot. There wouldn't be too many people that I would actually want to actually be on the show with me. But out of a lot of the people that I've worked with, Joe is probably the, the only one out of maybe the last three jobs that I've had prior to doing this full time. that I would be like, you know what? If I could choose one person to record with me that is super funny, super real, super authentic, uh, has had crazy stories and a crazy life, um, and is just a really cool, down-to-earth dude that I could be friends with forever, that's Joe. You know, and like I said, he was like the guy I talked to uh, initially when I first started because they had this like strapping the pallet shit. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. You know, and there's like certain people when you go to a job, certain people have a vibe, even though like, you know, everyone is like tough and everyone's trying to like do their job. It's physical work, you know, but sometimes you got to be able to ask for help and not be that idiot trying to like act or pretend they know what they're doing when they don't, you know. So Joe is a real one. And uh, obviously Dodger connection, you know, my dad and. uh you know, and obviously, uh, right is, uh, and just being real, you know, we all fuck up. You know, we all make mistakes. We all go through good times and bad times. But again, you know, it's not about, you know, if we get in trouble or we have to start over, you know, or, or quit some bad habits and try to, you know, be better. Uh, I mean, me and Joe have partied, uh, you know, to the extreme level, to the extreme, 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 both of us. But I think sometimes you get to a point where he's like, damn, I got to slow down. You know, I gotta, I gotta make some better decisions. So, I'm trying to give up the soda. Shipping department in Lake House, good for you, bro. You know, and I'm glad that our paths crossed when they did. And I already knew that you were a real one too, because you know, you saw me not like how everyone else saw me. You know, they just saw me like, oh, this guy does, you know, uh, streaming or YouTube, but they're just like hating because they don't even come and watch. They don't know like the knowledge and how I actually do the show and the cool people that we have in the room. Like there's always going to be a perception when you tell someone that you're a streamer or you do YouTube, regardless of what sub count you're at, people are always going to hate, you know, or, Oh, I could do that or but whatever bullshit they want to come in their head. But, but Joe was cool because Joe even donated to me like money out of his pocket when we were at the warehouse together. Not very many people would do that. Even some of my friends, you know, donate. And it, it feels good to have people believe in you, let alone if it's someone that you work with, or someone that you're friends with, because usually friends don't support other friends. People just kind of go about their own lane and it's like, oh, whatever, if he does good, but not better than me, you know, and that's kind of the attitude that a lot of people have. But, you know, Joe's like, oh, I want you to make sure you have this 50. So that way it's not like I donate 50 and you get 35 of it a month from now. That was real, you know, and that's why I already knew at that very moment that like, I like you, bro. And I was like, I'm going to give you a lot of my vintage Dodger collection that I got from my dad and my dad's got like a bunch of doubles. And so it was like, I felt good for me to be able to give you uh, and without purchasing and like give you, you know, some vintage Dodger cards that some, if they were graded would be worth some pretty good money. But just the fact, even just in the regular plastic holders, something that you can have. And when you get bored or with your son, you can flip through them. And sometimes on like a rainy day or when you're bored or whatever, you just flip through them. It's a cool feeling. You know, to be able to go through some Kofaxes and some Drysdales and, and some Fernando Valenzuelas and, and fucking look at that shit after you have it and appreciate that it's worth money and it's cool, but, you know, just remembering uh, the cards themselves and whatnot. So, yeah, good for you, bro. You're always a real one, and I always keep it real, you know. But one of these days, you know, maybe for – uh you know, Raiders or uh, Dodges, you know, we'll, we'll figure something out. You keep doing your, okay, you got stuff that you're still working out. So you still got your stuff you're working out. You got to spend time with your son. You got your job. You're trying to be a uh, more straight edge on life, you know, less partying, trying to get priorities uh, in order like myself. And uh, you've been on a Conseco kick. That's crazy. Uh, my buddy Dave that I took to the duck game, uh, I got to I got gifted tickets here on the channel to go see Colorado and Dion and uh, and obviously go go see the Ducks and Bo Nix and um, in his car he had like one of those like lunch bags and it was like it was in full of like graded and non graded cards and like I remember him from back in the day he was into it a little but not like hardcore but now it's like hardcore and I'm opening up the bag on the drive to Austin. And he's got like 20 Conseco rookies, 20 like fucking Don Mattingly's, like 20 fucking Wade Boggs. And I was like, Tony, Tony Gwens, 20 like fucking Kirby Puckets. And I was like, the good shit too, like the rookie cards. And some of them graded pretty high. And I'm like, damn, dude. I was like, this is like my type of style, but even like a little bit above and beyond on some of these guys. And I was flipping through um, 
some of the Pinsecos and it made me feel good. I was like, Dash Bros, Meguiar's. It's like, yes, I know the roids and all that. But if you, you go back to the junk wax era, nothing will ever compare to 80s, 90s collecting. And even though a lot of that stuff isn't worth a lot now, the nostalgia factor is higher than any other era where people like really do appreciate uh, that era and those cards, like big time. Five cards last week, and then Ozzy, yeah. And you met Ozzy, right? You partied with Ozzy like one time, right? You know, so especially if you lived in California. I always remember Ozzy too because I got the upper deck rookie card, you know, like 89 and 90. And I remember like, oh, Jose Canseco. I was like, ooh, I got Ozzy. And I knew Ozzy wouldn't be like Jose, but I, I don't know. I just have a, I'm a sucker for like dads and sports and uh, brothers. Like I like the family vibe when I can see a father-son combo. That's like special to me, you know, or, or brothers. I think it's cool. I don't know why, but it's just, it just is. So awesome, bro. Well, I'm going to end the stream and probably go on a walk. I got to go eat dinner, watch some film, um, game plan for tomorrow for obviously Thursday night football Broncos chiefs. Don't be surprised if the Broncos actually don't get blown out. It, it's a possibility that it could be a big blowout, right? Like a 42 to 17 kind of game, or Maybe Denver plays a little bit better offensively than we think. The Chiefs fuck up a little bit more than we think. Denver's defense, we agree, is terrible. And maybe the game ends up being a little bit closer, like, you know, weird close, like 24 20 close, you know, Chiefs. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, come back in the room uh, anytime that you can. I love you, brother. I will always talk you up because that's what you do with friends. And it's not talking up and being fake. It's like if someone is a real, Real motherfucker, a real OG, you know, no one says it like, you know, you think that some guy goes up to another guy friend and be like, dude, uh, you know, I appreciate you, you know, like it's just not something that most dudes do, you know, let alone in person or, you know, over the phone or in chat, but I will always a ride or die for the people. And I want to let other people know who the ride or dies are. So if they ever come across that person, they're like, oh, that's fucking O dogs ride or die. That's a, that's a Dodger fan. That's that real dude. The funny one. The one that's got the personality to, to match. So I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I'm going to think about stuff for tomorrow. Get the thumbnail going. Congratulations, Diamondbacks. You earned it. Corbin Carroll, you're a future Hall of Famer. You're better in the box than Julio already. Um, love you. Probably should go get a rookie card auto of Corbin Carroll before uh, it gets too late. You want to grab one within the first two years. So that way you get one for 100 to 200 and then you can flip or keep it. Otherwise, you wait past the second year, then it's like 250 to 500. And for most of us, that's too much money to spend on a card. So uh, you guys are the best. Dodgers, um, you know, Joseph, my dad, it'll be better, you know, but sometimes a spade has to be called a spade. And when you look at something that even though they have a national, global, you know, phenomenon, history, it's special Dodgers like Yankees, but sometimes good things come to an end and injuries always prevail. And it's a hot and healthy uh, is always going to be better than the best record. And, and the best record has a break The momentum leaves. It hops on some other guy's couch. They start eating chips off the belly. And then you get a diamondbacks, amazing four, two victory. And the brooms came out. So we can appreciate what it is. Dodgers will be back, but they need to get healthier pitching and uh, they need to have better clutch hitters. And the five through nine hole was terrible all year. It wasn't good enough. And Joe, obviously watching Dodger baseball would agree. So uh, I love you guys and I appreciate you very, very much. And uh, thank you to everyone that donated, commented, shared, sub count. You guys are the best. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. A lot of real talk. And uh, MVP, Paul Seawall, baby. Let's go. How can I not, as a Mariner fan, root for this team? Let's go. Pacific Northwest, Corbin Carroll, Pacific Northwest. Mariners, Seawald, let's go, baby. And I got one question for you. Who you know talk sports like us? Your boy, Ryan, Northwest Sports Fanatics. Mookie, season over. Corbin Carroll, it's not over yet. I love you guys, and I'm out. Gang.